Yes. <laughs> Motion to yeah. the executive session. Oh, yeah, this one. Is on 4246. Yeah. Okay. Session reconvene in open session. Second. Motion to second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Motion to seal the executive session minutes pursuant to section 42467 of Rhode Island general law. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Motion to reconvene. Motion to reconvene in open session. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Okay. We just had to clean up some executive session uh, stuff, so. Uh, procedures. So let's move on to number two presentation. Uh, presentation by Jeffrey Heath, PhD, Principal Middletown High School, in reference to ensuring success for all students, emphasizing career education and exploration at Middletown High School. Motion to begin presentation. Second. We have a motion to second to begin. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Dr. Heath, how are you? <clears throat> all right, how are you? This President is our Lawrence. excellent high school principal. Right thank here. you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the council, thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, I'd like to present some of the career education opportunities that we have going on at the high school right now, and also to speak through how our career and community partnerships are working currently in regards to student credit recovery and some other aspects of the education that we're working with at the high school. So I think there's some really innovative and exciting things going on, um, and you know I'm just really thankful, honestly, for the opportunity to be able to share. So that being said, um, if we could click forward to the first slide, please. Thank you. Uh, forward one more, please. So in heading to pandemic education with COVID-19 last school year being my first school year here in Middletown, there were some anticipated challenges that we all knew we were going to have to address as educators and as a community. Um, some of them would include health and wellness challenges. Um, we all know that masking has been a pretty hotly debated topic up until fairly recently. Um, quarantine, vaccination, close contacts, et cetera. So those have been very prevalent at the high school and trying to figure out what that looks like for us and our students. Uh, forward, please. Additionally, attendance and continuity. Um, in realizing those challenges related to health and wellness, um, how do we keep students in school and faculty members in school as well for a prolonged period of time? Um, and when people do have to quarantine or take recess from school, how do we get them back caught up um, in a way that is conducive to their learning and to keep the train rolling essentially? Um, that couples with the term learning loss that we've all heard, I think, used over and over again. How do we make up the curriculum, essentially, that students were not able to do as COVID education was much slower than traditional education? So those are some of the things that we did expect. Some of them that we didn't, that we're currently dealing with, are policy uncertainty. Forward, please. You'll notice that um, it's fairly small writing, but at the top, the first upper portion of that graphic is version 1.4 of the ride COVID playbook. Um, the bottom version is the most recent version. It's version 8.0. So when you think of all the point twos and threes and fours and things that come in between those playbooks, um, there's a significant amount of ride coming out the Department of Education and saying, this is the last example. This is the last change. This is the last change. And that's been happening for the better part of two years. So adjusting to those changes has been somewhat difficult. Um, reintegrating students into the building is also something that was unanticipated. Um, not so much so the physical reintegration, but the social and emotional integration in the sense that um, we're seeing a lot of disciplinary issues that we didn't quite expect on the way back in. Um, Examples being last year, we had, I think, four days of out-of-school suspension for our students. Um, as of March 1st, that statistic was 217 days of out-of-school suspension and climbing. Um, we have some pretty significant behaviors that we're seeing between students and faculty members and students to students as well, um, which was definitely not anticipated. So we've been dealing with that. Um, super thankful from, from the town and Middletown police to have a school resource officer coming back into the building. I met with Officer Toomey today, so um, hopefully he'll be able to help address some of those concerns and get us on the right track there. Uh, the bottom two bullets here on this slide with the loss of collaborative opportunities and large scale poor academic performance are really what, what relate to the presentation for tonight. Forward, please. This is a graphic right here that represents all students at the start of this school year, grades 10 through 12 at Middletown High School. So you figure there's 618 students to start the school year, but eliminating that freshman class because they had not yet been to the school that's the 454 students that are left. When you look at that slide, um, if you could hit forward, please, the red dots indicate the 64 students starting the school year that had no numerical shot at graduating in four years. 
So day one of school, grades 10 through 12, they could get straight A's from there on out and still not graduate in four years because of the number of F's that were incurred over COVID, um, prior to COVID, and, and et cetera. So we had students, quite frankly, that didn't engage with school last year. They just did nothing. Um, and some of that was legitimate for family reasons and otherwise. And I think some of it was related to the Xbox um, and video games. But figuring out how to get those students across those stage without essentially fudging it um, has definitely been something that was weighing heavily on our minds administratively and, and also with the faculty heading into the school year. Uh, forward, please. Alarming as well is the idea that if now you add those orange dots, those indicate the additional 35 students that can't graduate if they get one F in any class over the course of 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. So now when you add a student who might fail a phys ed class somewhere along the line because they don't see eye to eye with a teacher or et cetera, those are students who once again numerically couldn't graduate in four years. So that was an alarming problem heading into the school year um, with no real solutions from the Department of Ed surrounding school districts or otherwise. So what we did as a faculty was, was really sat and thought long and hard about how we can give students meaningful experiences and career education um, and how rather than sitting a student in front of a computer and doing module-based learning, while that's helpful in some capacities, um, how can we get kids to be involved with the community, connected to career and business pathways around us, and give them really experiential opportunities to put their hands on things and learn and experience you know, education in maybe a little bit of a different way than we've done it in the past. Uh, forward, please. When you break down the numbers just a little bit more digestible, that means that if you were to walk by 14 kids at the beginning of the school year, one of them wouldn't graduate in four years, statistically. And forward one more time, please. When you add that additional at-risk population, two out of 10 students wouldn't graduate in four years. So that's what we're, if you hit one more time, 21% of our students, just over 21% of our students, forward please, um, would not graduate in four years if we didn't have some type of brand new program, which is what we've been rolling out this school year. Thank you. Uh, forward, please. So in speaking to career and technical education, there's currently RIDE Department of Ed sponsored pathways that we have at the high school. And while those are excellent, they're revenue streams for us at the high school. The more students we have enrolled in those programs, the more dollars we get, both from the federal government and from Rhode Island. Um, Unfortunately, the Department of Ed's definition is rather narrow for what those look like. Essentially, the only pathways they allow to be offered at schools they consider to be high need and high wage jobs. So um, whether they be Aquidneck Island local or otherwise, doesn't really matter for the Department of Ed. Um, they have a list, a prioritized list of what schools should be offering for pathways in Rhode Island. And while that's valuable, and um, definitely excellent when we talk about career opportunities and partnerships and getting students a livable income, um, it, it, it paints a pretty narrow picture of what students can do and also doesn't necessarily apply to what we have locally here in Middletown and around us. So um, thinking through that, how do we expand on this relatively narrow interpretation of what career education is? That brings us to the next slide here, where myself and the associate principal, along with the dean and some veteran teachers, part of the last school year, essentially, um, to reach out cold calls to community partners and see basically plain ball. Um, the conversation was, you know, we have things, students that are, that are in need of credits. Um, I don't want them to learn at a computer, so can we strike a deal essentially where, you know, they can attend the Oliver Hazard Parable, put on two jackets, go down to the Bowens Wharf waterfront and learn firefighting on a boat, learn how to change a bilge pump on the bottom of the boat, um, integrate with the people who are working there full time work in the shipyard and maybe rub elbows with some of the yacht crews and things of that nature and see if there's summer summer job opportunities. Um, right now we have about 14 students in that program. Um, and out of the 14 students, the deal was if you go six times, doesn't have to be consecutive, but if you attend six times, I'll give you one elective credit towards graduation to help kind of reduce those 99 and 65 numbers that I showed before. Um, I'm happy to say that out of the 14 students that are attending, uh, none of them have ended yet. The shortest amount of time attended so far is 12 classes, and the longest is 47. So I have a girl who's actually been there, um, a high point, doesn't even need the credit, who continues to go just because she thinks it's fascinating and, and a great opportunity forward. So that being said, that's one of the bullets there. These are all people listed low and, and sometimes a little bit more um, that have agreed to either host internships, have online learning 
applications for our students. Um, in some instances, like the Harishoff Museum, that second bullet, um, starting this fall, we're gonna have 10 students go there and get paid to not only earn credit, but they'll get a $10 an hour stipend to build their own skiff. Um, so that after school program that they'll get paid and they'll earn credit and they'll make community connections. So those are kind of win-win-wins all the way around. Um, even added to this list this past Friday, we had a meeting with the uh, Narragansett Bay Commission, the wastewater facility in Ports and uh, Providence, excuse me, and um, they've also agreed to partner with us. So they're not on the, the slide yet. This was made prior to that, but um, they're super excited about having our students there as well. So we're really trying to tap a lot of different job opportunities and use them to, to not only gain credit for students, but to make those career connections. Um, and what's really exciting about this, please, is we started making phone calls in January. So this isn't since September. This is January 1st of the new year till today. So I think what's really exciting about that is I've pretty much had no, nobody respond not interested. Everybody is interested and they've been calling other business partners and things that, um, with opportunities, some big, some small, um, to get our students involved and engaged with the career workforce in the local area. So we're super excited about the, the perspectives looking on here. Um, some of them, as I said, are already tried and true, ready to go. Some of them are start, slated to start in the summer or fall. Um, but we're really having a lot of success in reaching out to local organizations and doing some meaningful work. So thank you. Forward. So why not just stick with career and technical education pathways? This is where we get into some of the, the more you know, holistic and universal benefits that we have for our students. Um, these types of opportunities, when you talk about the wastewater facility, et cetera, um, that's something any student can get involved in. They have biologists, chemists on site that, that analyze the water samples. They also have the engineers that build the infrastructure. They also have um, the laborers, as they call them, who are doing the, he the hard and heavy lifting, you know, in the field. Um, and there are a variety of different credentials, so we're hoping to get a lot of students in that regard. Um, CTE is more looking at, and career technical education, excuse me, is more looking at biomedicine, engineers, and in some of those, you know, higher, more technical jobs that students potentially could be going post-secondary to colleges as well to learn about. Um, we're trying to offer opportunities for all students as well, and that's where some of these opportunities come in. Um, hopefully establishing connections to the local workforce, as you can see up there, um, increasing experiential learning opportunities so students can get their hands on rather than just a computer, um, but actual things that they could potentially use outside of high school. Um, we talked about credit recovery, and then also it positions us for potential changes in Rhode Island graduation requirements. Uh, one of the conversations at the Department of Ed right now is to revamp what it re what's required for students to graduate high school um, and one of the big changes that I've honed in on are, uh, they no longer say courses, students need four courses in English, they say four credits in English. And if the Department of Ed does move that direction, for me, that's kind of a, a, an implicit message that we don't have to think about credits anymore as students sitting butts at desks, you know, that students can learn and earn credits in a variety of different ways. And I think having these partnerships and starting these relationships with people really set us up to have a meaningful learning experience where maybe someday down the road we can have a student transported midday to, you know, Oliver Hazard Perry or midday to the Harishoff Museum and be basically doing a running internship, learning things like mathematics and engineering real time instead of sitting in a classroom and listening to you know, direct instruction from a teacher, which has its benefits but also has its shortcomings. Um, I think providing those different opportunities for all students is really a direction we want to head. So forward, please. Um, for our final slide, so where does that leave us? Um, we are continuing to establish these community partnerships. We, we're looking to get a phone call out to IRIS. Um, also, the Chamber of Commerce is somebody who's high on the list that we have not yet spoken to that we're looking to get on the, on the horn. Um, we have some local internship experiences, as I said, that start up this fall. Um, we actually, I'm happy to say, on the career and technical education front, haven't slowed down there either. Um, just recently, we got an email yesterday, actually, saying that the biomedical pathway, um, which currently is a local pathway, meaning it gets no funding, um, was preliminary approved to receive funding, which is our biggest program. It's twice the size of our engineering program. And just to give you an example of numbers, engineering every year, um, for the Middletown High School brings in anywhere from 40 to 60 grand. Um, Biomed is twice that size. So that's a huge chunk of change for us to be able to grow that program and to be able to double and triple dip that money into some other science and education initiatives that we could do at the high school. So I'm really pumped about that, excited about that opportunity. And then finally, we've worked um, on uh, 
putting in a career explorations position. So um, we're hoping to hire an educator um, either this summer or later in the summer months um, to come to the school and teach an elective course, which will be new for us, um, that will be almost completely driven by uh, guest presenters and people from the local community coming in talking about the different educational and career opportunities that they're involved with and how our students can get involved and the hope is that we'll be able to get our students off site as well from the high school um, to go do some on-site learning with those individuals um, and that will be more of a, a facilitative experience for a teacher to link up with local community members have them come into the school see the items that we're doing types of things we're passionate about and hopefully you know grow and, and, and really strengthen some of those partnerships that we've already started and things that we're looking to start. And uh, to help fund that position, we did apply for a, a $150,000 grant from the Van Buren Foundation. Um, and we had a second round meeting last week, last Wednesday, where the foundation came and met and did a site visit. And um, I thought the meeting went extremely well. Um, and it seems as though, you know, I don't want to knock on every piece of wood around, right? I don't want to jinx it, but it does seem like we might be have an opportunity to be funded an additional $150,000 to, to fund that position for at least a few years to come. So super excited about those opportunities as well. Forward. Forward, please. So that takes us to the end of the presentation. Just time for <coughs> questions. And, and once again, thanks for allowing me to present. So. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate Thank you. it. Yeah, uh, Council of Toronto. Thank you, Mr. President. Good evening. Good to see you. Thank you for coming in. Mm -hmm. I applaud you on this. Thank you. This is really awesome. Thank you. Um, as we've been looking at trying to work with the schools and Dennis, could you speak into the mic, okay. please? Uh, you know, working with the schools and and over the last year or two, you know, career career orientation has been something we've wanted to really focus on. You know, you're probably tired of me saying it, but it was the backpack, the briefcase. Mm -hmm. You know, these children are going to be leaving our school and they've got to have an idea of where they're going to go when they get out and, and you know, what the civics are, what the cost of living is. And here's the opportunity and this is where this opportunity will take you over the next two, three, five years. And let them make those decisions. Whether that will be the end game for them, I don't think so because, you know, there's so much opportunity in life. But it enables them to leverage their education and, and get some insight into where they might want to go when they get out of high school. And it's not just college. It could be, it could be a trade. It could be all these. In fact, I'd like to see the kids out of school, tw you know, 20 hours out of the week when they, uh, 20 hours out of the week when they are in 11th and 12th grade into the community trying to figure out where they're going to go next. Yeah. Maybe have a combination of a little virtual learning too. If some children can do that, then let's do that. And I like the idea of credits as well, not classes. And, uh, and working with RIDE and pushing back on them, because they do push a lot down onto the school, and, and the school has to take on that responsibility and by state law and then that ends up coming to the you know to us up here and you know we're we're trying to fund the right stuff so i really applaud you on this program and, and i'm here to support you thank you thank you thank you dennis uh mrs flynn oh thank you mr president uh thank you again also for for coming in and it's about time that we got out of our, our paradigm of education and did something um, more relevant and uh, for to meet the needs of all kids. Uh, so again, I also embrace that. One of the things as we do these different things, and it's great that RIDE is okaying the, the credit portion of, of this whole program, because that's been a big stumbling block, not just for youth, but for adults going through college and getting credits and not being given credit for what they already know from their past jobs and things. So this is huge. Uh, my, my, the big question mark for me is the, how to track it, you know, the, how to find out what's really working and not just to get them to graduation. I know that's the immediate goal, but where are these, and I've always, I, this has been a question mark even before COVID, before new, new paradigms, you know, what is happening to our Middletown youth that first year out of high school, that third year, that sixth year, you know, what is their um, you know, debt taking ratio? What career are they in? Did they, did they start college and finish or did they take a different path? Is there any way to, since we are revamping 
to embrace some of these, you know, post high school so that we can tap in and make sure that everyone is reaching a, a higher level of success? I think that's a great question and, and a great next step in the sense you know, one of the one of the silver linings, there hasn't been many, but one of the silver linings of COVID is the idea of, you know, virtual contact, right? And the idea of how maybe not necessarily difficult it is for people to get in touch with one another through things like Zoom and Google Meets and Google Forms and a lot of the digital applications that we've used over the last year or two to correspond and collect data and things like that. So I think there's a lot of opportunity that's coming out of that. And um, to speak to, to that initiative, I do think that would be super valuable information to have. And I think it's more accessible now than ever. So Great. yeah, definitely a conversation to continue for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mrs. Santos. Thank you for coming. And bear with me, English is my second language, all right? Ironically, I received a email regarding this meeting tonight, and she was very specific, <clears throat> excuse me, in listing various companies that students may be interested in participating in getting credits who are not college bound. She named Electric Boat, great for welding, rigging, pipe fitting, even Raytheon. Now, we are losing a lot of people who don't know trades. The trades are going down the, down the well. The um, plumbers, electricians, door masons. She also made a comment that some of the students don't even know how to count money. All they use is a credit card. So where are we going from then? Have you approached any of these companies, like National Grid, Raytheon, Electric Boat? Have you approached them for credits? So, so we do have a call into Electric Boat. Um, I, I think that those are absolutely people that we'd be looking to partner with. Um, again, seeing as to how we've really kind of only been making phone calls since January, uh, you know, we're, we're doing our best essentially to outreach, but the plethora of people that can be involved in the career and technical you know, internships and experiences that we're going to offer our students is really no limit. I mean, and, and to speak, you know, to your to the, some of the companies you listed, um, I think those just like Narragansett Bay Commission and the wastewater treatment plant, those are right up the alley of people that we also need to get on the docket. Um, to, one of the big things I think for all of those partnerships to speak to kind of one of the one of the outstanding question marks. Um, and again, with gas prices the way they are right now, transportation comes up. So how do we transport students to these places? Uh, right now, unfortunately, we're a little handcuffed in the sense that um, the further away that a partnership is, the more likely it is that a student will have to transport themselves. So places like electric boat for us are a little bit difficult in the transportation front, but that doesn't mean it's a no-go. That means it's something that we need to, I think, carefully consider and think through a little bit more and put a lot of voices at the table to figure out how we might be able to transport not only kids who have their own cars and can drive their our parents with transportation, but how do we investigate things like busing or, you know, a, a, a municipal owned van or something of that nature that can get students to these internship opportunities? And then to Mr. Toronto's comment before, how could we maybe even do that during the school day sometime down the road as opposed to having to wait and be hostage to after school hours? So I love the idea and, and any, any you know, companies that we think as, as a community would be good for our <coughs> schools to partner with. I'd encourage anybody to, to pass them along. We're willing to have meetings with anybody and it's so long as it's a good fit for our kids, uh, you know, we're all aboard. So thank you. Thank you. Council Logan. I want to thank you for your tenacity. Face of adversity, you didn't leave any kids behind. I applaud you for that. I applaud you. you for that because the stats you put up earlier are shocking. Never in my lifetime did I think we'd see statistics like that in Middletown. I haven't been a product of the system, right? So just your can-do attitude, what's happened since January, obviously with the support of the superintendent of the school committee, thank you as well for supporting Dr. Heath in this initiative. This is a big deal. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I love the fact that you're not leaving any kid behind in Middletown. And I applaud you for that and thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Fun. Yeah, I, I have three things that I want to say, and I wrote them down so I'd make sure I didn't forget them. <laughs> okay. Um, as I've Question. said repeatedly, the people who are best able to address academic issues are the educators. This is a perfect example, and I think some of my peers have pointed that out quite well. 
As an educator myself, I also know that a large portion of social and emotional difficulties in children, as well as in older students, is a result of, of inadequacy and or academic failure. If we want to help our students to succeed, we need to ensure academic support first. That's what you're doing. And that's why I have supported efforts related to career education for all students. And I personally appreciate and applaud Jeff's efforts. Thank you. Jeff, um, I have a couple questions. So, you know, as I listen, I agree with Chris, I think we probably all do, that when you look at those, and when I read this earlier, some of the slides and stats we didn't have that yeah, you yeah, had, yeah, you must like have changed you're... it up a little bit. Yeah, because the clicking, I think. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, when two out of 10 students at Supreme Risk for four-year graduation, and um, I forget what the other one was, as I was reading it, I, uh, I was like, wow, how does this happen? So, of course, everyone wants to blame COVID for, and, and I'm sure there's some of those that, uh, that have happened um, with COVID, and you mentioned the games, and when we were full distance learning at one point, it was... I saw two kids in my own house doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, over here there's video and over there there's school. And so uh, I get that part of it. Um, but what I don't get is, is this can't be happening in just a middle town. It has to be happening in every school district. That's a fact, yeah, right, yes. So yeah. have you reached out to the school districts and are they doing similar things? Are you guys sharing ideas or, yeah. or borrowing ideas, so to speak? And, uh, that kind of thing, because I think it's great that, like Chris said, you know, you need to be applauded for not for, for stepping forward. Because, you know, where no kid is left behind, um, but at the same time, not every kid, as we all know, goes to college. So, yeah. some of these kids, I mean, this is the right. You are absolutely on the right path. The ones that are going to go to college or are going to exceed at college or exceed in high school, the ones that aren't, they probably don't know where they're going or what they're doing. They could be on the fence. Yeah something like this could certainly point them in, in a direction where they need to go or want to go, mm -hmm. or maybe they didn't know they were going to go there, yeah. and it worked out great. So wh what, are other, what are other communities doing? That's a really good question. So we did reach out extensively. Um, to be honest, again, full transparent, we're, we're kind of the leaders in this thought process right now, dead honest truth. Um, and the reason is because, traditionally speaking, when kids fall behind with credits, you know, whether it be East Greenwich to Barrington to Providence to Middletown, the solution is usually online modular learning. So you essentially outsource to a company like an Ed Mentum or an Edgenuity or some of the bigger names, and they have a biology course that's kind of canned, um, canned curriculum. You open the laptop, you click through the modules, you answer the questions, multiple choice, and then you hit next, and it goes to module two. And the student does that until they're done with however many, 10, 15, and then they give you like a check mark at the end and say, you now know biology. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, for me, it's just, that's like chewing on cotton balls for a student. You know, they're not enjoying that experience you know, in large part. There are some students that excel at that. The vast majority hate it. Um, we do offer that at Middletown High School, um, just like pretty much every other high school in the state. Um, and we do have online learning that takes place during the school day, which not every high school does, so that students can earn those credits and not have to stay after school and feel as though it's punitive. Uh, other than that, there's really not much going on in the way of credit recovery. And in heading into the school year, the Department of Ed identified credit recovery as one of the biggest caveats that had no answer. Um, so that's part of the reason why we started this conversation last May, to think with a lot of different stakeholders what this might look like for us and how we can kind of lead the show. And um, you know, I've had calls with Ride to say basically, hey, I, I want to make sure I'm writing checks I can cash, that um, I'm promising kids credits to be doing outside work opportunities. Am I above board? How's it going? And they were elated about the ideas, and, and they've talked about potentially having Middletown come in. But nobody's doing this, to be so, honest. Yeah. So yeah. what is Ride saying? Because, I mean, they, yeah. if it's happening in every district, I mean, are we sitting? Are they sitting on their hands? I mean, what's the deal here? So, so really, if yeah. you're the leader, great. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. But... I mean, they need yeah. to kind of sue, and yeah. who's advocating to ride that this needs to happen? Yeah, so I know from speaking from my experience, the principal's is that some pretty significant guidance need to happen. Um, we've gotten Tiverton and Portsmouth and Rogers all on board, specifically with Oliver Hazard Perry. We were the first, and they've kind of, and I've, I'm friendly with all of them, colleagues. 
talked, but um, talking to Ride, one of the things that they have brought up in public and in private sessions are uh, basically, you know, I hate to use the terminology, but the minds is world down. You know, so example being getting rid of requirements and saying marching band counts or sports count, whether right, wrong, or indifferent, where you are in that argument, that seems to be the route that they're going, is to revamping these graduation requirements, in some cases in what I would consider good ways, courses to credits be an example, but in other ways where, you know, we kind of take two steps backwards, where students may have to, in two years, graduate from high school with mandatory two years of world language, because that's what RIC and URI require. Well, now when we think about students that are career-oriented, not have interest in a foreign language and they may or may not have interest in an entry level requirement to a state school. So while we have these conversations right hand speaking career ed and promoting, just talking about graduation requirements that might narrow that path as well at the same time, which is to, to your point scary to be honest. Yeah, so, it was, uh, there's a lot of conversation out yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. the community with when you start talking about you know uh, career paths mm -hmm. or career tech. So you know somebody said to me this past week, well, you know I into uh, contractors and and two other contractors want to get involved where they could teach kids carpentry mm -hmm. um, I know somebody that's a licensed arborist that could teach forestry yeah. I know a couple of farmers in the room that could teach agric agriculture if need be it's there's a lot of there's a lot of resources right here that not just for Middletown if that so be but for, for the island kids that you're working with, whether it's Tivitt and you know, Portsmouth or, or Rogers. So. And there's a local pride to that too, you know, and there's a networking component that you don't yeah. get traditionally. So there's, there's all kinds of peripheral benefits to that kind of work too, which I think, I think again, talking about the minimal silver linings I think that come out of COVID, I think re-envisioning what we can do for schools yeah. and learning is big, I do. Well, listen, thank you for your presentation. Great job, applaud you for, for taking the lead um, in, in the state, really, from what I'm hearing. And if anybody can pull it off, it's you. So great job and, and keep doing what you're doing. If any way we can help or get involved, let us know. And thank the administration as well and the school committee for, for helping as well, okay? Thank you so much. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Say something. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Tammy Holden. A couple of quick comments. I love the presentation. Thank you so much. Um, a friend's son is in the Oliver Hazard Perry program, and he's struggled mightily. Um, and he's gone several times, and something great happened to him recently, or a little while ago. He had gone there, and they were doing some sort of navigational program or something. And, and somebody said, oh, who's good in math here? I don't, I'm not sure what I'm doing. Somebody on the ship. Oh, who, and she stepped right up. And he's figuring all these out. He's doing all these calculations. He came home beaming to his mom. Like, he needed me to do this for the navigational program. It was very, very cool. So that was so nice. The other thing, my only concern is a lot of these programs are funded by grants. You know, grants don't last forever. And grants run out. And then how do you continue these programs? It's just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Tammy. Yep. OK. Jeff, thank you again. Uh, great job. Let's move on to the public forum. Uh, number three, pursuant to Rule 25 of the Rules of the Council, citizens may address the town on one subject only, said subject of substantive town business, uh, neither discussed during the regular meeting nor related to personnel or job performance. Citizens may speak for no longer than five minutes and must submit a public participation form to the council clerk prior to the start of the meeting. All items discussed during this session will not be voted upon. Uh, we do have a form, Teresa Spangler. So nice to see you again. Oh, a long time. Yeah, I know. A couple hours I know. Ago. Just your name and address for the record, please. Teresa Spangler, 132 Peckham Lane. I'm here to speak on the neon gas station, and I know I brought this up a month or two ago. And I just want to reiterate: yesterday it happened. I saw two people turning left. I was at the red light, heading towards my house. Um, th this afternoon. Coming to our meeting, I saw somebody else as I was coming out of Wyatt Road. Um, it's happening all the time. Summer's coming, and we're going to have the tourists back on the street on East Main Road. What I'm seeing is people coming out of Dunkin' Donuts and turning left, which they have the right to do, but then you've got the East Main Road people turning left into Neon. And again, I was here during all those meetings when they, were, when they got their approval to build that facility 
One of the stipulations was very clear from the planning board or the zoning board, I can't remember and I apologize, and, and actually coming before you folks too, that they were going to make sure that there was not a left-hand turn coming in from East Main Road. When I brought this up to you, somebody said they would talk about it. I really encourage you, before we get in the thick of tourism season and a lot of traffic on that intersection, that something is posted. There should be a lef no left-hand turn on East Main Road, facing East Main Road. It's an accident waiting to happen, and I'm telling you, just this week alone, I, if I could pull my phone out fast enough to take a picture, I was trying to videotape it, but I didn't want to get myself into a car accident. Um, but I do encourage you, please, for the safety of our citizens, that that is fixed and that there should be no, uh, no left-hand turn posted on their property. Okay. Thank you. Just, just so you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, when that Dunkin' Donuts was approved to, to go in there, was supposed to be no left-hand turn coming out of there as well. And that should be posted, too. I mean, I, I think that... How do you enforce it? That's the problem. But the difference with the Dunkin' Donuts is there's no, there's no other way to go in and out, whereas the neon gas station has the, um, the light. Because I remember when the Dunkin' Donuts was built, the bank would not let them go and, and cut through their parking lot. So they banished that, which is why the Dunkin' Donuts ended up with the way they are. But the neon gas station has their entrance and an exit on Aquidneck Avenue, and that is what their deal was. Very clearly, they stated at this podium that they were going to make sure that people going into their gas station were going to turn left at the light and then left into their gas station. And so that's the Dunkin' Donuts thing, because I do remember the Dunkin' Donuts wanted to cut through the bank. That was after it was done, because there used to be no traffic light at Wyatt Square. It was a flashing yellow light. And it was a flashing yellow light coming out of Aquidneck, too. Right, right. So a lot has changed since then. Right. But that Traffic was after the fact. We actually, the town actually approached years back the Bank of Bank. America, and yeah. they did not want to hear it. Right, because they didn't right. want the traffic going through there. Yeah. But I'm just sharing with you, before we have an increase of traffic for the season, um, I see more and more residents turning in there. So I just yeah. don't want an accident. Mr. President, may I ask a question? Uh, yes, ma'am. I just want to clarify, Teresa, if you don't mind, because yeah. I, I have two different lefts in my mind, and maybe they both apply here. So you're heading west. If someone's on coming east, this direction. On East Main. On East Main Road. And they're, they're turning heading left into the neon in the entrance that's on East Main. Correct, which is right near the Wyatt Road yeah, branch. Yeah. So and when you're going this direction, you can turn right into there instead of going to Wyatt. People are turning left into that same opening. Okay. So and it's not an issue of people leaving the gas station and turning left onto East Main. They can't, no, they can't do that because okay, it's curved. That's, I just want to make sure they were Correct. not doing it's, that. Okay. It's from East Main turning left okay. into it. <clears throat> okay. Coming this direction. I got you. Thank West. you. Thank this you for the right. clarification. Terry, it's the other left. Yeah. yeah the other um, Sean. So after Teresa was here the last time we did pull the zoning board decision and there is no stipulation uh, restricting that movement from the roadway. Uh, so that, that does allow people to, to access the driveway uh, from the direction she's, she's discussing. Um, we, we are having a discussion with the owner, trying to see if we can work something out, but um, I just want to clarify that the zoning decision does not reflect a, a restriction on that driveway. Um, the one thing we have pointed out to the owner, I, I think the, the one piece of leverage we have is there's a, a double line on the highway, which people aren't supposed to cross, but, right. but that gets back to an enforcement nightmare. Yep. So uh, we're working on it. Okay, great, thank you. Mrs. Mrs. Santos. To add to Mrs. Spengler's um, problem, or town problem, you have a problem with the people exiting from the Aquidneck portion, because what they want to do is take a, take a left onto Aquidneck Avenue, head down the beach. Now, when the old Grange property opens both entrances, if they do, you're going to have collisions galore because you're going to have the gas station, you're going to have the other entrance coming onto Aquidneck Avenue. So it's going to be a nightmare there. It, it is a nightmare already. And people running the red light on East Main to get to Aquidneck. I saw that. Mr. President? Yes, ma'am. I, just a question for Sean or the solicitor. Uh, so I'm wondering if uh, Teresa heard that stipulation at the planning board and it was a recommended uh, condition of approval that the zoning board did not embrace? I, I don't know. I just know it's not in the decision Zone. itself, mm -hmm. which would indicate that the zoning board did not uh, make it a condition of approval. Um, 
which once again limits the enforcement authority yeah. of the town. There is a state road as well, so there might be some, if we can't yeah, park something out with the owner, you, you have to try to deal with the state. Planning board is advisory in nature, so. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Wendy, is there anybody um, watching from home that wants to participate in public forum? Uh, I didn't no see one, the light no go on, but yeah. no one's I'm trying not to. Okay, excellent. Okay, Vice President. Motion to act as a Board of License Commission. Second. We have a motion to second act as a Board of License Commission. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay, acting as a Board of License Commission, number four, application of Flat Waves LLC DBA, the Food Shack, 499 East Main Road for a Class BV alcoholic beverage license for the use of the same premises. This requires advertising and notification to abutters for a future public hearing. Current license for this premise has not been issued and was surrendered back to the town by CCE Development, LLC. Motion to receive the said application, advertise for public hearing, and notify abutters for a hearing on April 18, 2022. Second. Motion to second to receive and advertise and notify abutters. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? <coughs> Motion to reconvene as a town council. Second. I have a motion to second to reconvene as a town council. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Town business update number five. <laughs> Memorandum of Council of Toronto in reference to update requests, project updates. Motion to receive said memorandum. Second. I have a motion to second to receive said memorandum. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? President, uh, I put this on. It was going to be more for a town council discussion. Um, when I first started the council, I had added this section of an update on in Middletown and something that we were going to address once a month to bring up old projects that are on a list and just get an update what's going on with those projects. And the order, when we changed the uh, policy, when we put the policy in place, it was where we needed at least two weeks' notice. So as soon as I leave a town council, project update, I would have to send in a request to have a, an update on the next town council meeting. And I've tried to explain kind of what I was looking for, and I just wanted to run it by the council to see if they have an appetite for it or we can leave it the way it is today. But my intent was to have an established project that would stay in place. At the beginning of every month, we would get a two date on major projects that we have going on in town. It's kind of gone to where we get a notice now of what the departments are doing on a daily basis. And that's not really what I was looking for. And I think it's actually creating work for the departments. I've actually heard from some departments that they are upset with me because they said, they're the re I'm the reason why they need to give these updates. And I'm like, well, that's not exactly what I wanted. And so I'm trying to get it where the projects stay on this in the beginning of every month, we get data where we're at with these projects. I just put a sampling of projects down here. The council wants to look at them and add to the list, but I propose that it's a standing list that until the council says, let's take that list, we completed it, or we're not doing it, we can just update the list as we go forward. But this is a good way to continue to track all the projects that are going on, big projects, make sure we know where it's at and I think we actually even discussed putting it on a website so if someone has an interest in drilling into it we may even be able to show timelines notes when it's going to complete and if we're on budget but I know that takes a lot more work I'm just looking to have you know this update stay in place so I don't have to keep going back and asking for an update so I make a, I'd, I'd like to make a, a motion that we change the format of this section and have a standing project list that we get an update on on a monthly basis. The first, month, first meeting of each month. Second. Okay, we have a motion second. Is there any further discussion? No, just <coughs> to ask. Mrs. Von Billis. Um, I, I, guess I'm, I guess I'm looking at this as um, depending on how much work is involved. I mean, if this is a report a written report that you want, then that's something that is time consuming and takes away from things that are more important. On the other hand, if you'd be happy with a, 
a summary from the, the administrator that would just update in a few words exactly what's taking place, I think that's very, very manageable. Yes. And that was kind of the intent of that, because we said it's not for questions about the projects. If you have questions about the project, you put it on the docket for a little bit detail okay. discussion or reach to Sean. But I think this also gives the community a quick, uh, brief description of what's going on and where it's at. Okay, just, just wanted to clarify that, to, because, I mean, that kind of thing, as a, as a person who's been in that position, when you have to do report after report after report, it's extremely time-consuming. But, but in fact, if the administrator were able to, or, or whoever, were able to give a quick and dirty kind of um, right. uh, summary, you know, two minutes, two minutes for each item. Right. Works for me. Okay, great. That's what so, you're looking for? Yes. Sean, what, do you, what, do you, what is your input here? Well, we, we've had this discussion numerous times, and I never get the impression that this is a simple two-minute report or there's a two-minute expectation. Um, I, I think one piece I, I've heard um, the time we, we need to get information about what we're doing. Um, I, I look at a monthly report of what we're pushing out through the Public Affairs Office. Um, we, we, are, we are touching thousands of people every day with updates about the projects that are going on. And quite frankly, um, you know, looking at the list of what was provided by Council of Toronto, I, I think we've written numerous articles about each one of these things. So I, I think the public is is well informed of what projects the town is working for. Um, I, I would just go back to the amount of time I have. There's one administrator for a lot of departments and we have a lot of projects uh, and work right now. So I just want to be really clear if it's going to be added to my responsibilities, then um, there is something else I'm not going to work on because there simply isn't, I don't have free time. It, it doesn't work that way. Um, you, you update anyway, right? I do, and we fall behind, but I think uh, right now more than ever, um, we're extremely busy. I, I know Council of Toronto wants to talk about the process, and, and certainly, you guys, I work for you. I, you know, whatever your pleasure is, that's fine. But I'm just going to go through the list of items that, that you started with and, and just we? give you an idea of what I've been working on, because I think, I think a lot of it is discussed. Um, and ways that this is redundant. So uh, senior housing, affordable housing, the Council of Toronto actually updated the council just recently. Um, we are trying to get the master plan application for Oliphant and Berkeley Peckham in for May. Um, I have a meeting tomorrow night with the Oliphant neighborhood. Um, we have monthly meetings with the committee. Um, so we're, we're, we're busy there and we continue to make process. Uh, progress with that that whole project. Uh, in fact, I think one of the things that we also do with the committee is we prepare a report that talks about the uh, the number of housing units that are being developed within the town, um, and it's in the number of hundreds. And that that reflects work that's being completed by Ron Walansky, who's a Department of One right now, um, but, but also impacts departments across the town. Um, on town and school consolidation, you're familiar with my activities, not so much with consolidation, but uh, with regionalization, um, the due diligence that uh, both myself and uh, city manager Nicholson have undertaken um, to investigate whether or not school regionalization is something that uh, is something that you would want to pursue further in a more formal manner. Um, that is taken on a considerable amount of my time. But again, I, I think everyone's familiar with it. Um, education. Uh, Dennis provided an update on that at a past meeting recently. Uh, the committee, committee had two meetings this month, uh, one I was able to attend, one I wasn't. Um, the committee's active. I think we have a budget. Um, there, I have another meeting coming up about uh, some sort of blue economy program. Again, um, you've been provided an update on that. Uh, you're familiar with the tiered tax program. Um, I'm working with the assessor to make sure we have a, a robust program uh, to communicate to people within the community about the exemption program to get them signed up. Um, I'm also communicating and working to get the seniors, the veterans, and the blind uh, people that are exemption, uh, eligible for those exemptions uh, to make sure they sign up and that they're aware of the new exemption levels. 
Um, I am involved with the West Main Road development. Uh, that includes not only meetings with the solicitor, uh, but meetings internally, meetings with our partners, and we are working towards uh, a hearing with the planning board on 421. Uh, a lot of the work that's been done with that, again, um, with the public affairs through my office is setting up with uh, Mr. Sheely's assistance, the Middletown Shares website, monitoring the survey that we're using to monitor uh, public input. Short-term rentals, another council priority. Uh, we're implementing the amendments to the ordinance that were recently adopted. We're transferring responsibility from the clerk's office to the building office. Uh, we have a new employee in the building office and we're trying to get the second one on board. Mayford River restoration. Um, I've been working with NRCS to get the funding for that project. Um, we actually submitted a letter through the NRCS program for probably between 13 and 14 million dollars to implement that product project. Um, again, that project requires uh, a number of meetings as well as a lot of coordination. Um, more coordination recently with DEM as we start to look at what's necessary to do the soil testing and how it will impact our local residents. And then lastly, the planning board build out recommendations. Um, I actually don't have Ron's update. He got it to Maureen and I didn't have time to work on it. Um, a so, lot of those projects are on Dennis's list and I'll just run through that because I, I just, if you don't mind, Mr. President. Um, affordable housing we mentioned, Middletown Commons I mentioned. Uh, the Green and Avenue roundabout, the town engineers getting a revised quote from the engineer and that will be forthcoming. On roads, uh, road projects, and we talked about a bond uh, the town engineer and public works director are compiling the project costs so we can propose that. Tax reform is the tiered tax program, which we talked about. Middletown Outreach, you've received briefings. The school building committee, um, the town council approved a $60 million plan. Uh, I think up until today, there was a little bit of um, guidance that was necessary or discussion that needed to take place between the town council and school committee. Um, the council president myself met with representatives from the school committee and the school building committee, and I anticipate that will be moving forward again smartly at the end of the week. Uh, the Middletown IT department update, that's a conversation between town, so, well, it's, 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 I don't know if it's a, a project at my level or if it's a discussion that's happening with Matt Wainwright, um, but basically that's, that's part of ongoing operations and part of the budget under consideration right now. Pickleball courts, we're waiting for the Rhode Island DEM grant and keeping Middletown clean. I don't actually have a project that I'm working on. It's part of the current operations of the department. So um, I, I'm more than happy to provide the update, um, but I think a lot of this is either items that have been published to the entire community um, or that you, you receive updates already. So, so I, I got to ask this question, Sean. So what do you do the second <laughs> half of your day? What's that? What do you do with the second <laughs> half of your day? I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's very busy and it's, it's very broad. And I I, I'm lucky to have the staff and, and just, you know, again, I, I pick on Ron. Ron's half a department. The tax assessment department yep. is in half. So, um, so Mark, I would, Mark I would is, and I'll just, Mark is, 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 is at, ha you know, reduced staffing. And I know from talking to Wendy today, um, we're, we're redistricting. Um, we're dealing with election issues. Um, it's just, it's just an extremely, and then, and then I think it's just the expectation coming out of COVID. Um, yep. You know, we're, we're just, we're very busy. That's the budget. Uh, there's that budget thing. I, yeah. Yeah. Um, budget thing. yeah. So I would say this, and, and I'm only one person speaking here. Um, but we do have conversations amongst ourselves, phone calls or whatever here and there is, as we continue to add projects, and some of these projects pop up where you just can't refuse or to, to at least explore it, right? They pop up. At that point in time, I would expect that you would come to the council and say, hey guys, because we talk about this, hey, we got to prioritize things here because we're kind of, a lot of good things going on, but how much can, the, can you handle? So at any point in time, I'm not saying to tap out, I'm just saying raise your hand and go, guys, time out. You know, I think this is, let's, let's, let's reorganize this, so let's reshuffle the priorities based upon what we have. But certainly an update, I think, keep it brief. Um, I know they tend to get out of hand. I promise you I won't let them. Because if they do, I'll stop it. 
Yes, ma'am. I actually thought that that was a, an outstanding, quick, brief summary for the citizens who might not have caught that article or didn't have it pushed to them or missed it. Um, and if, if you could just do just that, I think, and if somebody's triggered that they want to take some extra action, whether it be someone from the public or someone on council, um, I think that that's a good impetus to, to hear and to do that. So if that would work for you, Sean, to just off the top of your head kind of rattle it off, I, I thought that was great. Yep. Very helpful, actually. Council Welch. Um, I agree with Councilor Flynn. Hurts a little bit to say that, but that is true in this. <laughs> this um, I think Speak that up. I think that uh, what Sean just did was could very well have been off the top of his head. And I know that you deal with it all the time, 24 hours a day. And for me, that was great. I mean, just to hear it all once. And what I might do to to tone it down a little bit is to not necessarily go through every single thing that nothing has happened but just hit the ones that they have. It's kind of like a refresher. I don't, I don't want to put a whole bunch on your plate. However, I will say again, deputy town administrator. <laughs> Can I add Coming you? soon. That's another conversation. Uh, Council, well, uh, we'll help. Council Santos. I didn't know I changed my name. I, I stumbled. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. In fairness to Mr. Brown, I've worked with previous administrators, Mr. Fitzgerald, Roberts, this man has got more on his plate than spaghetti, okay? I mean, we just keep adding more and more onto his plate. Let's get certain things done and get them off the plate. Eat them. Get things done. I understand. Sometimes things take, you know, there's a process and some of the time. We just yak, 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 yak. That's all we do. Is that what we do? Yes. Okay. You Thank included. You. Thank you. <laughs> That's how you get things done. You talk it through. Oh. And you do it thoroughly, <laughs> but things take time, Mrs. Santos. It can't just be. I know it takes nine months for somebody to be born. But my gosh, how many <laughs> months? How many months has he had th these things on the docket? Well, some of them are big projects, never undertaken by a town before. Let's give the man time. a break. Okay, if that's what you want to do, make a motion to give him a break. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, what can I tell you? These are projects. That's what we pay him to do. He's doing it the best he can. And like I said, if it's too much, he needs to stay. Hey, guys. I need to talk to you. I need to time out. We need to reshuffle or reprioritize. That's how it works. Mr. Brown wanted to say something. Brown, did you want to say something, sir? Um, no? I, I'm, I will keep <laughs> okay. you updated. Thank if, you If so we need much. to create we, a we space, a if, if, if I could ask just not to make it, if we could just leave it informal. That's the way it should be. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm fine. That would be Good. my request. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. We have a motion and second on the floor. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the consent calendar. <laughs> any any councils want to pull off any items off the consent calendar? 13. Council Welch? 13. 13. Sorry. Thir 13. Okay. Um, motion, please. The motion to accept the consent calendar minus item 13. Second. We have a motion to second to adopt this consent calendar minus item number 13. All in favor? Aye. 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 Number 13, communication of Teresa M. Spangler. Silvera Spangler, sorry, Teresa. Chair, Middletown School Committee, in reference to the Middletown Public Schools generating general operating fund is projecting an expenditure deficit of $1,259,000 for the 2021-2022 fiscal year. Motion to receive said communication. Second. We have a motion to second to receive. All in favor? Aye. 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 Councilor Welch or Councilor Flynn. Go ahead, Tom. Ladies first. Uh, well, I noticed that the superintendent and school committee members are in the room, so I thought I just wanted to make sure that they had an opportunity to be heard. Yes, so this item is on here because we have to receive it. Last time we talked about it because I had put on about an audit. The reason it's on here tonight is because it didn't make the deadline for the last meeting uh, on the cutoff for things to be put on the agenda. So that's why it's on the agenda so that we can receive it, okay? Council Welch. So I don't know who wants to answer, but in looking at this to try to understand a little bit better the numbers that are out there, I'll just pick one, for example, HVAC. So I'm assuming all the numbers that you gave us are overages, right? That's why the, the deficit is there. 
So when it says HVAC repairs, $61,000, is that because there were inoperable HVAC components, or is that because they failed during the year? In other words, my, my question would be, stuff hasn't been working for a while, we needed it for COVID, it threw you over, or we had failures that you weren't ready for. And it would help just, this whole thing would help me if I knew you budgeted X number of dollars and it went over by 61 or I don't know what those numbers mean. Okay, um, well thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, address this issue. And we have attorney Miller here with us uh, that's worked on these numbers with our um, outgoing um, director of finance. So before we, we talk about these specifics, I would like to put the, this whole um, deficit, uh, the 1.2 uh, million in context. Uh, so it's an opportunity for all of you to hear it since we weren't here at the last meeting and it's an opportunity for the public to hear it. So um, for the current school year, we are predicting a budget deficit of approximately $1.2 million. That means that based on the current estimates, by the end of this school year, our expenses will likely exceed the amount of fiscal support we receive from the town and from the state. There are several factors uh, that contribute to this gap. One is that state aid for Middletown School Department has decreased over the past several years. The other is town appropriations to support the operations for the public schools have been relatively flat. flat. The other piece is our cost to operating the district continues to escalate sharply year after year. And the last major uh, factor is our students require more special services than they have in the past. The extent to this, this need has been surprisingly great, as Dr. Heath pointed out, just at the high school. And we are challenged to find the additional funds to meet those needs. So we've bridged the gap over the years with using uh, strategies, including reduction of staff, reduction of programs, reduction of staff, um, not only teaching staff, certified and non-certified, but central office staff. And we've also eliminated or reduced programs. We've applied our surplus, our fund balance, saved from prior years, uh, including our military impact aid dollars, to the, our reoccurring expenses. As of last year, we have all but exhausted those surplus accounts. Each year when we present our budget, we make the fa this fact known and we request additional funds to support these reoccurring programs. I wanna add that the school department has made strategic changes in the business office, including hiring Dina Dutremble as the interim business manager. Mrs. Tr uh, Dutremble is reviewing all of our financials to ensure accuracy of every single line item that we have, all of our encumbrances, our purchase orders, and where we feel in this letter that we've overexpended. Earlier this year, we did hire an accounting technician and a benefits clerk. We have also have budgeted for an accounts payable clerk position. We haven't hired that yet. But these are key changes that will strengthen and uh, the functioning of our business office. So in conclusion, um, what, what I do want to say is that while these factors help explain the budget deficit for the current year, the school department's long-term fiscal viability is being deeply compromised by a more significant revenue challenge. The school department has sounded the alarm about our structural deficit every budget season. It is critical that we work together, the town and the school department, to address this significant, significant challenge. This does not ha if this doesn't happen, we will continue to go down the road where we'll have a negative impact on our teaching and learning. And be assured that the school committee and myself will continue to advocate forcefully 
for our adequate funding, both at the state level and the local level for our students to move forward. But we also need to commit both entities to work cooperatively with our town council on a performance audit. That's critical, the performance audit and pieces of it, so that our expenses and programs are, are scrutinized and we welcome this. As I said, this is essential for us to gain your trust and your confidence uh, in our operations daily. So I wanted to answer your question with the broader context because I really think it's important for everyone to hear that. Now to go on to your question, uh, Mr. Welch. Um, Lori, do you wanna yeah. talk yes. about that? Sure. Sure. Good evening, just uh, by way of introduction. Excuse me, could you just state your name and address please for I'm the gonna record. do that right now. My name is Lori A. Miller. I live at 15 Heidi Road in Lincoln, Rhode Island. I'm currently an education attorney at Brennan Recupero, and I have over 35 years of experience in school business, so I understand school finance. Councillor Welsh, what I will tell you about the 61,000 after a cursory review of the purchase orders that make up this um, encumbrance amount, uh, they're mostly there's, there was one, there was a chiller that was down, it's water heaters, it's boilers, it's, it's things that break during the year. Uh, in, in my review, and it was very cursory, please understand that, uh, I did not see anything that was, you know, greatly unexpected. I just think the equipment is old, it hasn't been maintained, and I think, you know, you're, we're paying for it now. Okay, thank you for that. Um, on the same, so I have two more questions. Uh, one is snow removal. Well, the number of 1.2 million, I just find it interesting that you picked snow removal at $20,000. Now, I, I don't know what was budgeted for the year, um, but am I right in assuming that the 20,000 that's on here, or actually 20,188, is over and above what was budgeted? That's correct. Now, I do plow snow. I live here. This year and last year, very similar. Four storms we plowed. We did have one storm that had a fair amount of snow, but it was light and fluffy and easy to move, so not terribly. I'm just wondering how, why you would choose that. I mean, that is, of all the other line items, the snow removal is worthy of being on here. That's the reason for the deficit. So, Snow removal was, was chosen because it's an item that we can't predict every year. I don't know how much snow is going to happen next year. Uh, I make an a educated guess about a mm -hmm. budget number. Unlike supplies, where if I know I have a deficit, I can tell schools, no more spending, we're done. If we have a snowstorm, I can't tell people, don't plow because we don't have any money. I have to, we have to pay, we have to pay it and we have to have our schools in good shape so people don't get hurt and kids can come to school. So that's why I selected it. Just curious, how much was budgeted for snow removal? Off the top of my head, I do not remember. I'm happy to provide that information to you tomorrow. Okay. And uh, thank you for that. Typically the town takes a three year, three to five year history and that's what's budgeted. So, and that would make sense, but then that would say that it went over by 20 grand this year. I'm, that, I'm just trying to follow yep, the same logic. Understood. So my, my last question is, um, the superintendent told us about new hires that were brought on to help with the financial problems of the school committee and make it, or school department to make it better. Um, were those budgeted positions? Because it sounds like that was fairly recent that to me would throw you over so the um the account technician was budgeted and the benefits uh clerk was budgeted mm -hmm. the uh an individual in the department moved from uh the accounts payable position to the accounting technician position now we need to fill her position so in the end, you didn't hire anybody new that wasn't budgeted for at the beginning of the year? We, um, hmm. yes. I need to check that. I don't want to misspeak and okay, then come back. I need it, to it check that. It would make sense to me if you hired somebody yep. midway that it would be on the sheet and it's mm -hmm. not, so. Yep. Okay. Thank you. 
President? Mrs. Flynn. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to piggyback on Tom's request, although it was my request back on March 21st um, when the docket came out or the, the, for that meeting. And I did ask the budget, the approved budget amount for each of the line items that you had presented. And I'm going to ask for a, a more holistic look just for these line items so I don't have to uh, shuffle through a great big report. If we could get the last five years uh, budget and actual for just these line items. I, I don't want, you know, 14, 40 pages. Uh, and the reason the last column would be obviously we see where it went over, but there a little um, prose of why it went over in each of those categories once you have that information, Ms. Miller, if that's possible. Yeah, we'll, we'll be happy to do that right now. Um, Mrs. Dutremble is going through the major lines that we've identified here and looking at them in way more detail. So it, within the next couple of weeks, and we did have a discussion with the administrator this morning, the, today or yesterday mm -hmm. about this, within the next couple mm -hmm. of weeks, we will have a much better handle on what's, what's happening. As I explained to Councilor Welsh on Friday, the idea is we want to get a really good projection for this year because that's going to inform our budget for next year. This is still a work in progress, and things can change. This is a budget over expenditure, if we get more revenue at the end of the year, this number will get lower, it will decrease. So there's, there's a lot of things in flux and we're trying to come in at the 11th hour and get more information, but we're happy to comply with your request. I understand what you're saying, um, but I'm hoping now that because the town's overseeing the purchasing that maybe we don't purchase things or spend things that we don't need to spend on and that will hopefully reduce it a little bit. That's what I'm hoping for. Um, and again, look, we, we're, not, we're not here. I think we've all had our fair share of, uh, of being upset about this. It, it's, um, um, it's a level of accountability. Um, you know, it's, it's very difficult on this end to swallow when we're not walking in your shoes where you go, okay, all of a sudden, and I get, I get the increases for um, special needs, um, but at some point somebody had to say, well, time out here. You know, we need to figure out what's going on as far as the, the, over, over, uh, the, uh, the deficit with that, because that's 1.1 million of it's coming out of there. Someone should have raised their hand and said, hey, town, we need help. But look, we are where we are. We're not going to argue about it today. Things do change sometimes, people get heated, but um, we need to move forward on how we're going to fix this. But those numbers need to be right. As you want them right, we want them right. We want to develop that trust and we want to move forward. We can't continue to go like this. Whether it's totally you or whether it's us getting upset with you and you know, airing our feelings publicly, um, those are real feelings, and I'm sure on your side, you don't like it as well. <clears throat> but we need to fix this, and it needs to be completely transparent. Because if it's not, don't bother. And I'm sure your intentions are good. T totally agree. Okay. And we're committed to do that. We're committed I just want to, to make you sure this isn't, this isn't, you have a war outfit on. I just <laughs> want to make sure that you're not, you're not, you're not declaring stuff. war on us up here because. It has sparkles. All right, just checking. There's no wish Just to check. Hide with sparkles. There's no wish to hide. <laughs> All right. That, that's, what we, that's what needs to happen. Okay? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Appreciate it. And we, we are going to work together. Having you, uh, you met our interim uh, finance director. Yes. And uh, she's doing a, a great job. I've heard a job. lot of good things yep. about her. And we, we meet uh, weekly with um, our town administrator and fin town finance director and uh, council and Welch came in to talk to us about this. Yes. So, and all of you, any of you are welcome to come in and we'll go over these Thank things you. with you too. Thank you. Yes. Is there something different, Mr. Spangler, that you'd like to add? I do, I have okay. to add something. Excellent. And actually, Tammy, I give credit to Tammy for doing the research. Okay, um, thank you, Tammy. You know, I, I just, and I know we've talked about this before and I'm not trying to beat a dead horse, but she did some statistics for other communities for percentages. So in 2018 for Middletown, 2018 was a 0% increase, 2019 1.1, 1 .1, 2020 was 0, 21 was 1.6, and this year was 2. 
So over a five-year average, we've had an increase of 0.94% from town appropriation for, middle, for our public schools, 0.9%, so less than 1% on, on an annual basis. So uh, of course, with the funding formula losses and things like that, it's, it's accumulated. And we have, as Rosemary had said, we, we have been sounding the alarm for several years. Newport, for example, had an, an average over five years of 1.5% increase. So not much more than us, but a little bit more. And Portsmouth only have a three-year average, and they did 1.8 increases, 1.8%, I'm sorry. So we understand, obviously, all the districts are, are having difficulties and struggling, but I, I think, and we've said this before, some kind of consistency would be very helpful long-term from the town of, okay, this is the minimum that we're going to give you, so this is where you're at. Let's see what happens with our budget, if there's going to be able to be availability of more. I just think that that predictability, just like we were wishing for a funding formula and we got smacked with it in the wrong way for Middletown, from the state, but I think predictability would be very, um, would be an asset for, to, for, uh, for success. It would be a, a, a positive thing for the budget to be able to have some predictability of what the percentage increase is gonna be on an annual basis. So I'm just putting that out there of part of the conversation for long-term appropriations. Hmm. Council Toronto. Yes, um, Teresa, thank you. Do those numbers include like the things that we help along during the year, like when you come forward and say, we need new tennis courts, or we need- the Tennis courts, those uh, things aren't school, those aren't schools- no, but I'm just saying, property. do those numbers include that? No? Now this is, this is the, the town appropriation for the, <clears throat> the operating budget. When it comes to the tennis courts and those kinds of property things, that's town property. So that's why um, the, it's capital improvement. So it's supporting the, the but facilities it, are used by the town. Uh, the how about in regards well. to like Chromebooks, when we $400,000 in Chromebooks, does those numbers include that? That was, no, it doesn't. That was also um, impact aid money that we used on that okay. as well as some town, some town CIP money. Right, so there are those times that those dollars do you do come to us and we do need to make those decisions because we needed those chromebooks because That's, of covid and remote learning and it was important that we would do that so, so. Those, those types of uh, um dollars that you do uh, do give us to to help with chromebooks and the the uh, renovations of of the property the track, the, the tennis courts, you don't want it in an appropriation like this because then you're dealing with maintenance, maintenance of effort. Okay. So it, that does not include okay. those. Expenses. Well, I'm just looking at the overall. Right, but if they were to be fixed, you'd have to budget for them <laughs> is his point. Well, I'm just saying that you. That's, it's like you just want to make sure that, hey, look, we know we're a little cheap, but, you know, mm -hmm. we have a, a whole town we look out for. And, of course, kids are, are the priority, right? But so are the taxpayers. So at the same time, we're trying to balance that and Absolutely. do the best we can. And we haven't agreed on, on past appropriations, and I understand your concerns. But at the same time, when they come forward to what Dennis is speaking to, we've given probably out a million and a half to two million dollars of, of non, you know, whether it's 500,000 for the track, 100,000 yep. for the tennis, mm -hmm. 500,000 or 400,000 for the Chromebook. So, you know, when it's needed and you come to us, we give it. And, and, and I understand what you're saying. One-time expenses versus the, what, Dennis, so what you said, those are one-time expenses, so those are not. You would still have to budget for that. I, I, I understand that, but they're not, you're not looking at that as having to sustain those yeah. dollars. And, so, and just well, when you put numbers, different. but when you put numbers out like that, I just want to make sure people understand that yeah. that's not the only commitment we make to the school. We make other commitments. There was a $10 million bond that the residents of Middletown passed to help that's not in that number. <laughs> right? So I'm just saying we we but try. I, I'm just saying that okay. I just want I just want all the numbers to be out there, not just Resident like well we got right. underfunded and and that's w reason why we're not we had to do this. I mean these are these are this is money that was spent out of funds that wasn't supposed to be spent. And and that's and I understand what you're saying is you felt you had to, and. I'm not going to argue that point, and you know we're going to discuss it in the budget because we have to now come up with 1.2 million dollars in the next year's budget to to support your overage. So if we want to keep these pieces in place that we have here, we want right all now, the facts out, right? So right. that's exactly. all, and we want to work mm -hmm. with you on we'll that. We'll work through it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
But I just want to clarify, Dennis, when you talk about structural improvements and mm -hmm. the funding coming from the town, that's for facilities and for structural one-time expenses. Without those dollars, the buildings won't be standing up. And we have no ability to generate revenues to sustain a, a structural brick and mortar. Right. So when you mention that, I also want to reiterate to the community that those dollars, we have no ability to generate. So that has to come in order to well, sustain our buildings for safety and health, right. which are also some mandates from the state for health and safety, like the security after school shootings. We all had to hone in on school security, cameras, doorbells, locked. We never had a locked door in the high school when we were going to high school. You'd walk out the sure. back door, you'd walk in the front door. You'd, but exactly. now you can't do that. So those and things all have cost money over the years, I agree. which are one-time expenses. Well, we and, so. and I agree with that. And it's the a capital improvement program that we fund for you. We, right. know, we put into the program. Those are one-time. Like you said, we did the whole front entrance for security purposes. Right. But a dollar is a dollar, okay? And different. we can we different can different monies. It's different but, dollars. Okay, look, let's I let's know. move let's, this, let's okay. move this I, along. I, we yeah. could talk I, all night on this. I understand the difference. It's so different thank dollars. you. Thank, thank you. You have something? I do, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I don't I, mind at all. Let's. I, I do appreciate yes, that, and I, I was going to wait till budget season, but when the comparison to the other communities came up, I, I just have to address this. Uh, it, you know, and they're absolutely right. The appropriation is a different than when they have a a large need, and it's a and it's an occasional uh, purchase or buy that they have to make. And the town needs to help them with that, to help our kids. I, when I, my first budget season was 2019, and I was the, the school committee liaison. And I did not know what I was doing. But the one thing I heard was that they had no control over certain increases, whether it was mandates, contracts, insurance utilities. And when the budget came in and they were not getting what they needed, the minimum, I actually voted against it. Didn't know what I was doing, but knew it, it wasn't really right. But I have to say that, you know, Mrs. Krager, if you are not getting what you need, you have to institute whatever that is out there that starts with Carullo. Uh, you're obligated. Uh, you know, you have, to, you have to make those hard decisions. I'm sorry, but you can't let it go on. You say that, you know, you expect regular funding and so that it doesn't, you know, impact our students negatively. Well, you know, if this council's not going to do it, it's up to you. It's your responsibility. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and Carullo, really, the only people that win in Carullo are the attorneys. Right. Um, and have certainly, I we have thought about going to, to for the Carullo Act a number of times. But, you know, we step back and we say, who really wins? We have to live with each other. And there's lots of acrimony that comes from any kind of Carullo Act and the findings and the dollars that are put to Carullo Act. So I think we're all bright enough, smart enough to figure this out to help our, our children. We do have that right. But again, the school committee has just gotten to that edge of should we go Carullo and we pull back because of that kind of acrimony and you know i'd rather there's, there's not been acrimony really <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, uh. you're right you're right but you know this performance audit we're looking forward to it because it will really you know demonstrate what we're doing you know what the town's doing we're we're excited about that actually we're in a good place yeah. but you know Absolutely. let's put it out on the table and yep. do what you need to do please mm -hmm. okay thank you okay I think we've exhausted this. Let's move on 14. to number, uh, 14. number 14, licenses and permits, communication of Lieutenant, and thank you for coming tonight. <coughs> communication of Lieutenant Corey Hawk, Newport Police Department Chairman, AINPP, -A and request for request for waiver, request for waiver of all details for the Quinnick Island Police Parade. Motion received said communication and waive all permit and detail fees for the Quinnick Island Police Parade. Second. The motion is second. Uh, I think it's great that it's back. All in favor? Aye. 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 You have a f question? Aye. Yes. So we have to pay for we, the town eats all the police details? Sorry, say that again. So all the police details for the parade, mm -hmm. the town still has to pay the officers, right? Yes. So we just throw that in. 
Yes. And it's a Quidnick Island police parade? Yes. So Portsmouth, Middletown, a bunch of other people? I, I could speak to this as well as a committee member for the parade for many, many years. Yep. Yes. It's all inclusive of the entire island, the entire state, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, New Jersey. We have a lot of law enforcement officers that come from all over New England to celebrate and lift up those who have fallen in the line of duty. So and lift up. As long as I can remember, it's always been covered. Yeah. Okay. Great Question. organization, great event, always runs without incident. Question. Mrs. Flynn. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so the, the letter to the town council ends with, as always, please consider this a formal invitation to join us in honoring the law enforcement community in attendance. And I, my question to the council is, does the council participate? I'm sure that our officers do. And I don't even know if we have a banner or magnet signs that could go on a car or. So during the parade, elected officials march together. Oh, from all the communities. With their respective law enforcement in their community. So if you were to show up on Sunday, May 1st, you would be invited to participate and walk with Chief Cure in front of the men and women in blue from Middletown. Better than the back seat of the car. <laughs> okay. I have a convertible. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Number 15, application of special event permit from Lieutenant Corey A. Huck on behalf of the Quinnick Island National Police Parade Committee to the Quinnick Island, for the Quinnick Island Annual Police Parade beginning on West Main Road, two mile corner, to the one mile corner into Newport Broadway will be held on Sunday, May 1st, beginning at 8.30 a.m. Parade, parade, respectfully, parade committee respectfully requests all fees to be waived. Motion grant said special event permit and waive all fees. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Is anybody opposed? Number 16 for special event permit from St. Columbus Chapel, 55 Vaucluse Avenue for St. Columbus annual garden party to be held on Saturday, June 11, 2022, from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. Motion to grant said special event permit. Second. Have a motion to second to grant any discussion. All in favor? Aye. Does anybody oppose? Number 17, application of, and there's four of them, special event permits from Rejects Beer Company, 124 Quinnick Avenue. The first one is for summer kickoff, pig roast and fish fry, island theme Free event for the neighborhood to be held on Saturday, June 11, 2022, from 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. Number two, the second event, end of summer barbecue. Free event with barbecue and beers to be held on Sunday, June, uh, August 21st, from 2022, from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. Number three, the third event, is the Simmons Farm Collaboration local event. Indoor music, Diego's Taco Cart to be held outside on Sunday, September 25th, 2022, from 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. And the fourth event is Oktoberfest, fall, fall beer release, to be held on Saturday, October 1st, 2022, and Sunday, October 2nd, 2022, from 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. Motion to grant said special event permit. Second. If a motion is second to grant. Um, I just have, Sean, I, I, I'm gonna obviously support this, but my only concern is um, parking, and I want to make sure parking is not forced into our neighborhoods across the street, the residential neighborhoods. I don't know how you do that, um, but I, I think you know it has to be a concern. Mr. President? Yes, ma'am. The last time that uh, Rejects Beer Company was in front of council, if I recall correctly, they valet park the cars, and they uh, have a, a known capacity Mm -hmm. And I think that they do limit the attendees mm -hmm. accordingly. Mm -hmm. I, I know I, I know she's here to talk about oh. it, um, but I, I brought that up because uh, I was told by by somebody that attended the event when their parking was full to just go park in the in the neighborhood. So that's why I brought that up. I'm not going to ask the question without you know at least Thank you. whether it's legit or not. I don't know, but you guys do a great job. I know you have it under control. We did post signs of no parking in the neighborhood last year when we 
um, when we had our October. Yeah, and I'm sure somebody's going to. We're trying to split it into two days so that there wouldn't be quite as many crowd, hopefully, on the one day. Could you just state your name and address? Yes, I'm sorry. My name is Lee Kermel, Rejects Beer Co. You were going. I couldn't stop you, but go ahead. 124 <laughs> Quidnick Avenue. <laughs> Um, we do have a number of bike racks too, and we had over 150 bikes there last year too. So we do push that and really promote that, and like scooters and Uber as part of our promotion for the events okay. as well. Excellent. Best yeah. of luck to you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate okay. It. We have a motion to second to grant. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Number 18, application for a special event permit from On Your Left Racing for a Newport Triathlon Triathlon Swim Bike Run event. Second Beach on Sunday, September 11th, 2022, from 7 a.m. to noon. Motion to grant said special event permit. Second. A motion is second to grant. Sean, um, obviously we're closed already at this point in time. Correct. Okay. Is it any interference with the Quahog chapter or the Camparama or whatever? No? Okay. Excellent. Nope. Uh, we have a motion to second to grant. Any further discussion? Just, oh, just yes, one sir. thing, one thing real fast. I remember somebody coming during public forum about the triathlon and about potential drownings. Is there, <laughs> and again, I want to make sure this gets addressed because somebody did bring it to our attention You're right. You're the right. last time this happened. Yep. Yep. So is there a contingency plan for them for additional support so that they don't have an incident? Mr. President? I can investigate that. Um, I know we looked at it last time, and um, somebody's here. Hi. Hey, okay, hang on one sec. Sean, go ahead. Uh, the the public safety uh, police and fire department didn't report the same conditions that the resident had reported, or the same concerns. Okay. Um, it was a, a rough weekend, but not um, as dramatic as was presented to the council, but. I just okay. want to make sure it was addressed. Yeah. Mrs. Flynn. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, actually, my husband happened to participate in that triathlon. It was his first. And How did he make out? He did very well. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> he, 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 didn't, he made it to the end. Excellent. <laughs> uh, and I have to say that the, the, they did um, shorten the swim okay. because of the conditions. But the, the suggestion, I think, as I recall, was made by the person at Public Forum was to have a backup over at Third Beach, if at all po possible, if there were conditions that were, you know, going to make it challenging for some. Like some are strong swimmers, yep. some are not. It's open to everybody. And you have to use your judgment. Um, but it, it is not a bad idea to have a backup. Okay. Your name and address for the record, sir. Derek Savis, 168 Cottontail Drive. Portsmouth. Could you just talk a little closer to the mic, please? Derek Savis, 168 Cottontail Drive in Portsmouth. Um, You're from Portsmouth? Correct. This is Middletown. Sorry. No, I'm just oh, kidding. <laughs> Sorry Go about ahead, that. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> um, this would be our, our third event. Yep. Uh, exact same setup. Um, and to Mrs. Flynn's point, last year the seas were incredibly rough. I mean, I know Second Beach has a ten tendency to be rough, but this was a little bit more uh, abnormal than usual. So we did shorten the swim. We gave people the option of um, you know, skipping it all together. Uh, we tossed around the idea of potentially using Third Beach as a, you know, so to speak, plan B. Um, ultimately, though, we feel that the logistics of transportation over there, lack of parking over there, would be more of a hindrance to the, the boat ramp and the public access over there. So um, if by chance the seas again are as rough as they were, we would switch the event to a, a run, bike, run, and forego the swim altogether. Thank you. Um, yeah. If that is the issue. That would that would certainly put us at ease. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Thank Derek, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thanks. Okay. Is there any further discussion? We have a motion and a second to grant. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Thank you. Number 19, application for a special event permit for Gray Matter Marketing, Amica. Newport Marathon, marathon throughout Newport and Middletown starting and ending at Easton's Beach. Newport to be held on Sunday, October 9th, 2022 from 7.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Motion to grant said special event permit. Second. The motion is second to grant. Is there any conversation? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay. Um, number 20. Application of special event permit from Dale Bradley for Camp Arama.
Camper weekend Ranger. camping at the beach. Satchewis parking, Satchewis Beach parking lot, beginning Wednesday, September 14th, and ending on Sunday, September 18th, 2022. Motion to grant said special event permit. Second. A motion to second to grant any discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Number 21, application for a special event permit for the Norman Bird Sanctuary for a harvest fair, old fashioned country fair with games, foods, crafters, music, and family entertainment being held on Saturday, October 1st. 2022 and Sunday, October 2nd, 2022, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Applicant requests all fees to be waived. Motion to grant said special event permit and waive all fees. Second. We have a motion is second to grant and waive all fees. Any discussion? <coughs> all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Let's move on to number 22, public hearings. Public hearings have been advertised. A butt has been notified. Public hearing remains open. In order to the town of Middletown, this is the second reading. In order to revision to the comprehensive community plan, the future land use map L4 of the land use element of the Middletown Comprehensive Community Plan is amended to bring consistency between the future land use plan and the town zoning map for selected parcels fronting on Tony Lynn Terrace and Reservoir Road. Subject parcels are identified in attached map. The planning board recommendation is on file. Public hearing remains open. Second. Okay. The public hearing is, does remain open from last time. Uh, is there anyone here that would like to speak on this? Does any councils have any questions from last time on this, on this change of consistency? Okay. Motion to close the public hearing. Second. Excuse me, Mr. President. Do you want to ask if there's anyone on is, Zoom? Thank you for your kind reminder, Wendy. <laughs> is there anyone on Zoom that would like to ask any questions? It is a public hearing. So if the if they just and I, I appreciate the reminder, I'm just having fun with you, but does the light go on or the light doesn't work or uh, we turn the light on if someone on. if someone had already raised their hand. Oh okay, very good. Motion to close the public hearing. Second. A motion to second to close. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion to adopt said ordinance on its second reading. So the motion can you get a second? Yeah, I was going to say so. Okay. Give me a break. <laughs> Okay, I'm an old lady. Okay, you're usually pretty quick with your second, so. Um, we have a motion to second to adopt this ordinance on its second reading. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Number 23, public hearing has been advertised and notice have been about, about has been notified. Public hearing remains open in order to the town of Middletown. Second reading in order to the town of Middletown. An ordinance amendment to the town of code of the town of Middletown, title 15 land use chapter 152 zoning code is amended to the zoning map to change the zoning district designations for certain properties fronting on Tony Lynn Terrace and Reservoir Road. Subject parcels are identified on the attached map. Planning board recommendation is on file. Public hearing remains open. Second. We don't need a second on that, but thank you for your promptness. <laughs> I wanted to say it fast. Oh, thank you, ma'am. So the public hearing remains open. Is there anyone uh, in the audience like to speak on this? Is there anyone on Zoom that has the hand raised or would like to speak on this? Okay, excellent. Are there any councils that have any comments or questions? Motion to close the public hearing. Second. We have a motion to second to close. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion to adopt said ordinance on its second reading. Second. We have a motion to second to adopt said ordinance on its second reading. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Number 24, public hearing has been advertised, the butter has been notified, public hearing does remain open. In order to the town of Middletown, it is the second reading. In order to revision to the comprehensive community plan, the land use, the future land use map L4, use plan map L4, of the land use element of the town of Middletown comprehensive community plan is amended to bring consistency between the future land use plan and the town zoning map for selected parcels fronting onto Quinnick Avenue. Browns Lane, Carriage Trail, Dexter Street, East Main Road, Fairway Drive, Goldenrod Drive, Green and Avenue, Johnson Terrace, Loring Street, Meadow Lane, Mitchell's Lane, Morrison Avenue, Oakwood Road, Prospect Avenue, Ridgewood Road, River Run Road, Turner Road, Wayside Avenue, Wintergreen Drive, Wood Terrace, and Wyatt Road. Subject parcels are identified on the attached map and the planning board recommendation is on file. Public hearing remains open. So this is a public hearing. It's a second reading. 
Um, I just want to state for the record, I live on Prospect Avenue. Uh, my lot is not included in this, just for the record, okay? Um, so having said that, the public hearing is open. Is there anyone that would like to speak on this? Mrs. Spangler. I have a question for clarification. This is not my expertise at all. Could you please explain or clarify um, the difference of the high density residential versus the medium? Because this is changing, most of them are changing from high residential to medium. Some are changing from medium to high. So I apologize if I'm ignorant in this area, but can and someone you're just not, clarify? You're not ignorant, you don't know what you don't know. But we do have an expert in the house and he's making his way to the podium. <laughs> Our excellent town planner, Mr. Ron Walansky. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, the, there are various changes, some high density to low, low to high, and, and, and other changes being proposed as well. Uh, specifically regarding low density and medium density, um, th by definition, low density covers R60 and R40 zoning districts. Uh, medium density is R20 and R30 zoning districts. High density is multifamily or R10 zoning districts. So in all of these changes... All the lot, the higher the density. And as I explained at the last meeting, all of these changes, no zoning changes are being proposed. These are simply changes to the town's comprehensive plan, future land use map, which would make, uh, which, which would achieve consistency between that map and the zoning map. So no zoning changes are proposed as part of this. Could you? Could I just ask a question on that then? So if, uh, if you said it's a, a multifamily, so if a, a residential neighborhood that's medium density is going to high density, does that mean that they're going to be able to build duplexes? Or, or that's not going to change? It's not going to change because there, there's no change to the zoning proposed. No zoning change yet, Teresa. But whatever you, they're allowed to do now, they're going to be doesn't continued affect to set, allow. Yeah. Affect you, setbacks or anything, nothing changes. The changes are being made to the future land use map in the comprehensive plan so that the, that map is consistent with the zoning map that's in place right now. Right now they're inconsistent. So that's being changed to match the current it, zoning. So, so nothing will change for Typically in the past, Teresa, you're con I understand where you're coming from. Typically when this is, happens and we update the comprehensive community plan, in the past planning has come forward and said, look, we need to change the zoning to meet, meet the new comp plan or whatever's adopted. This is not that. This is just the opposite where it's bringing, they said, you know what, we don't need to change the zoning. We need to bring a change in the comp plan to, to uh, be consistent with the zoning in this case. Okay, so what you're saying then is, so somebody couldn't go in an R20 lot and build an apartment house? No. Or in a residential, and, and just Any type of relief, they'd have to put, a, put an application and they'd have to go through the process. But, right, but, so yeah. that would have to happen though. So they would yes. have to. But there'd be no, there's no change being, this, this will not change their ability to create a more dense uh, environment or okay. to build more units because the zoning itself is not going to change. The zoning is going to remain. Okay. Mr. I'm just President. trying to understand that. Yep. So, that's all that, you learn. That's pretty scary yep. if all of a sudden you're changing from a, a high density to a low density or vice versa and then somebody could come in and build a yep. uh, Mr. President. multifamily home. Mrs. Flynn. Thank you. If I could just summarize the way I, I look at it and explain it to people, Teresa, is it's the, you know, the comprehensive plan, which is that binder, that book. It's almost as if there's a typo in there that doesn't match our zoning map. And so they're just fixing the typo. Is that fair, Ron? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course you wouldn't. Sorry, the, those aren't, this is in minutes. This is, <laughs> okay, excellent. You're welcome. Does okay. That, can I just ask? Yes. Mr. Ron, Hoffman. does that make us 100% in line between comprehensive and zoning? Um, I'll never say 100% because someone's <laughs> going to find something. But to the best of our knowledge, this will be the end of trying to make that, uh, make Excellent. those changes to make it consistent. Because it was challenging for us here because when they came to do a uh, build something, they would say, well, you need to prove it because this is what the comprehensive plan says. But then someone would point to the other side, well, zoning says the opposite. So we'd be caught in the middle, like, what do we do here? So thank you for pulling this all together. Yeah, thank you, Ron. Okay. 
Is there, um, is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item? Is there anyone on Zoom that would like to speak? <laughs> Any hands raised? The light's not on, there's no hands raised, we're good, okay. <laughs> Vice President. Motion to close the public hearing. Second. We have a motion to second to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. 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 Is anybody opposed? Okay. Motion to adopt said ordinance on its second reading. Second. We have a motion to second to adopt the ordinance on its second reading. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Is anybody opposed? Okay. In the recess. Oh, amazing. Okay. <laughs> second. We'll take a five minute recess. That means seven or eight minutes, but all in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
Perfect. Okay, we have a motion to second to reconvene. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, now in ordinances now, number 25, in ordinance of the Town of Middletown, this is a second reading ordinance. An amendment to the Town Code of the Town of Middletown, Title IX, General Regulations, oh. Sidewalks and This is amended by adding a new section, 94.7, Esplanade Sidewalks. Motion to adopt said ordinance on its second reading. Second. The motion is second to adopt this ordinance on its second reading. Is there any further discussion? Yes. Mrs. Santos. <clears throat> Mr. Brown. Recently, through Ms. Through our president of the council, we found out that the seniors have a list that they can get on, all right? Excluding them and having other people with sidewalks in front of their property, they're cleaning it. Supposing they should fall, break a hip, break an arm, who do they sue? This is what was asked to me today. So the adjacent property owner is responsible for the maintenance of the sidewalk. Whether Correct. It's summer, spring, fall, or winter. Right, but when the snow falls and they clean the sidewalks and they fall and get hurt, not a senior, just an ordinary citizen, say 45, he slips and falls, hurts himself. <laughs> who does he sue? It, the property owner, they can sue the town? No, they own the property. Sue themselves. The, side, the sidewalk's usually on the town right away. Not yeah. that I'm encouraging people to <laughs> sue the town, but, but typically, only, that would, typically they would file a claim with the town. Of, I'm only relaying the question, Peter. Okay. okay. But these are, these are Esplanade-type sidewalks where the grass strip would be between you know, the sidewalk and the road or the curbing so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some people think that's more attractive um, and it's less, less concrete or whatever the type of material that you use. That, that, was, the, that was the reason behind Okay, behind but it's these. still a sidewalk. Uh, I understand, but it's an <laughs> Esplanade sidewalk. Okay. Okay, Mrs. Sims. <laughs> but you All could right. walk on the grass. You can walk on the grass. Fall. There you go. And not clean the sidewalk. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Oh, can I ask a question, please? No. <laughs> yeah, you can ask. Sure, absolutely. You, you pay taxes here? I do, twice. Go right ahead. Two times. Well, good for you. Go if, ahead. If somebody, uh, if, if the sidewalk is built by the town and yes. they're responsible for the cement and mortar, correct? Because the resident wouldn't repair it if it's broken, correct? If it's on town, if it's on the road. See, it's an interesting problem because in a lot of communities adjacent to the sidewalk you're responsible for the, the repair of the sidewalk uh, we in Middletown repair the sidewalk yeah. so I guess my question is if the town's responsible for that and they put the sidewalks in why is the town not responsible to clean it and maintain it so if someone falls and they fall on ice and yet the sidewalk has a, a, a hole in it and then they're getting sued we've got an issue here which is this is why sidewalks are a good thing to some extent but sidewalks are also a an actual no, I understand, property owner's safety, nightmare. Things are going to happen, right? And that's why we have a trust that we, unfortunately, if, if something does happen and they sue the town, it, it goes for the, before the trust. But, and, and Peter. Yeah, there is a state law that, that yep. authorizes towns to pass ordinances that require the property owners adjacent to the sidewalk to clear the sidewalk. And so it's very common in Newport, you get fined if you don't clear the sidewalk after the storm. Um, yeah. But Probably Middleton would repair more it. aggressively than, than happens. But at the end of the day, but, Teresa, a sidewalk is much safer right. in, than in But the town locations. would actually do the, the brick and mortar repairs. Correct. Okay. Well, that's good. That's Unless good. it's a state road. And then the state's responsible. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. We have a motion to second adopt said ordinance on its second reading. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Other communications? Number 26, email communication of Vladimir. Storozinski, in re reference to requesting the town to raise the Ukrainian flag on any of town buildings to simply send the message, we stand with Ukraine and condemn Russian aggression. Motion to receive said email communication. Second. I have a motion is second to receive. Mr. Brown. Uh, typically for a request like this, the council would um, approve raising the flag in front of town hall. The last example of that would be the um, you approve flying the Autism Month flag uh, in front of the building. So 
Um, this is a request that, that communities throughout the uh, United States are getting from, from the community uh, in support of the Ukrainian people um, as they endure uh, the invasion by Russia right now. So um, it's really a decision made by the council. Um, the council president myself received an email from uh, our resident, Carol Cummings, yep. who um, has provided us a check uh, to purchase the flag to fly in front of Town Hall, um, if, if you choose to do that. Um, and I, I think that's really it. It's really just a matter of uh, your willingness to fly the flag and letting me know when, when you would want to fly it. Okay. I think that, um, and we also, she did provide the, a, a check to purchase the flag and, mm -hmm. and from fly, sunflowers and the Ukrainian colors in the, in the ribbons, the light blue and the yellow. You know, I know that... Um, there might have been some concern or maybe some concern about, you know, what kind of precedence is this set, but we take those as they come. Mm -hmm. um, I, I personally am going to support it. I think it's the right thing to do. Um, you know, I, I, yep. I, yeah, okay, excellent. Do you need a, uh, you, you just, do you need a vote on this or? Um, I, I'm fine either way. I, I think I you're will. fine either way. Thank you yes. so much. Just a quick question. Yes, it's, Mr. Toronto. It says Ukraine flag on any of the town buildings, so it's not all, it's just anyone we choose to. So my, my recommendation, we to fly it in front of town hall. We yep. have the three flag poles. From a protocol standpoint, um, the U.S. flag will fly in the middle. Uh, Ukraine will fly to the right and... Uh, the state flag will move over to where we typically fly the, the town flag. Okay, Great. excellent. Everyone okay with that? Yes. yes. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Vladimir. And thank you, Mrs. Cummings. <laughs> uh, number 27, I am going to recuse from. So, Mr. Vice President. Uh, Excuse me, Mr. President. Do you want to receive the communication? You had a motion and a second, and then you had your discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 She is good. <laughs> Number 27, communication of Nicole H. B. Barnard, attorney, senior staff representative, AFSCME, Rhode Island, Council 94, American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, AFL-CIO, North Province, Rhode Island, regarding a request that some of the American Rescue Act funds go to Rhode Island, Council 94, local 1823 members. Members work in the facilities and maintenance department at the Middletown Public Schools. Motion to receive said communication. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, Mr. Regan. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice President. Um, so this was um, referred over to me for review. Um, with all due respect to Council 94 and their members, in my opinion, frankly, this is a a request that should be directed to the school committee and not the town council since uh, council 94 has a collective bargaining agreement with the school committee uh, that agreement states that the Rhode Island Labor Relations Board has determined that the school committee and council 94 are responsible for negotiating the terms of employment uh, for the council 94 membership and, and my understanding is they're actually right now in the process of mediating the terms of that uh, CBA uh, so in my opinion, it's not really appropriate for the town council to step into the middle of that relationship uh, and that this request really should be directed to the school committee uh, as part of that negotiation process. That's my opinion. Okay. Any councilors have anything they want to say? Mr. Vice President. Councilor Flynn. Thank you. Uh, just as an FYI to uh, Ms. Barnard, the uh, Middletown ARPA project submission number 1232 was submitted on January 6th, and it is a suggestion for up to a million dollars for premium pay for essential workers, which includes cleaners and sanitizers and likely the union members that you represent. I don't know if the suggestion embraces your request, but you could check it out. There's also an update of the ARPA projects on this docket, item number 32, if you're able to stay. Sure. Just a name and address for the record. Nicole Barnard, uh, 88 Warrens Point Road, Little Compton, Rhode Island. Thank you. Um, so, um, uh, good evening, members of the Middletown Town Council. I'm attorney Nicole Barnard from Rhode Island Council 94, and I represent local 1823. 
the facilities and maintenance workers at Middletown School Department. They are 23 men who have worked hard for the town during the pandemic. Um, they disinfected schools, cleaned up COVID vomit, and many themselves became infected with COVID several times due to their work. They also continued to make repairs to the schools to keep them running. Um, these same men have gone several years with 0% raises in recent years. Um, when you compare uh, their raises to the Social Security Administration's cost of living adjustments, the COLAs, they are earning 11.6% less today than they were earning in 2007. Um, the school department um, has stated that they are 1.2 million in the red. Um, and so you can't get blood from a stone. Uh, we have people who need to pay their bills. Um, so we're coming to you because we have nowhere else to go to try to make sure the members of Local 1823 have enough money to feed their families, pay their mortgages, put gas in their cars and heat their homes. The recent inflation rates have made their wages very problematic. Um, uh, I, I said this a couple weeks ago and I'll say it again. Um, the uh, Department of Human Services, Rhode Island Department of Human Services guidelines state a family of four making less than $64,702 qualifies for help heating their home. The same agency, the State of Rhode Island Department of Human Services guidelines state that a family of four making less than $49,044 qualifies for help feeding their family. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our members fall into uh, one or both of those categories. In fact, a lot of them fall into both those categories. They're working 40 hours a week, um, more than 40 hours a week. They're working overtime. Uh, they're doing the snow, um, the snowstorms. Um, uh, they're coming in on weekends to do uh, various types of work that get that gets done. Checks and you know if something goes wrong, they have to get in there. If there's some sort of a a, a sporting event, they're in there. Um, most of our members are making less than 50,000 a year, even working all this time. Uh, and one of the approved uses for the American Rescue Act funds is retention and to help uh, employees keep up with the cost of inflation. Um, th these members did uh, specifically, uh, you know, come in uh, and were on the front line of trying to keep COVID at bay throughout the pandemic. So I understand that this is kind of uh, a little bit not the normal course. Normally we'd be going to the school committee, but the school committee isn't the ones who had, they're not the ones with the money. You guys are. And you have 4.7 million and we have a real problem for our 23 members. And we're hoping that you will consider um, parting with some of that money uh, to make sure that they are taken care of. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I didn't see what amount of money you were looking for. The amount of money you're looking for. I'd say it would be about, uh, I've thought about a few numbers. I think that uh, if my members aren't getting at least $3,000 uh, probably this year because um, they're not getting it anywhere else. I think they're going to be uh, in a bad spot. 3000 per employee? 23 employees. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Tom, for handling that. Uh, number 28, communication, Nic Nicholas Coogan, chairperson, chairman, open space and fields committee in reference to request to present recommendations for possible sites for futsal, futsal courts, futsal. I don't know, pickle, futsal, I mean, I'm not sure. Any soccer field. So. Yes. Like the motion. Soccer. motion received said communication. We have a motion. We have a second. We have a motion and a second to receive said communication. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Coogan. Okay, uh, good evening. I'm Nick Coogan. I'm the okay. chairman of the Open Space and Fields Committee, 31 Winter Green Drive. Thank you very much. Uh, we were charged, I think back in January, Open Space was charged with looking at possible sites for a futsal court in town. And uh, we looked at four sites. I gave you copies of the two top sites, uh, Potsy Field oh. parking lot, and the second site is part of the field in, by Oliphant School. 
<laughs> and so you can just have an idea. And on, on each of those is the uh, outline of the what relative the size of, of what the court would be. So one's labeled Oliphant School. The one that's not labeled Oliphant School is Potsy Field. Uh, the other two sites were um, Albro Wood and Tibbet Farm area. Uh, those two were are the least least desirable. They're they're still green. There's trees growing there. The last thing open space wants to do is go clear land to put in anything. Uh, the idea would be that this court would be put in um, and on an existing parking lot or that area of um, of the elephant ball field. Um, and then if the town decides they want to go ahead and proceed with this, then we would, I guess, contact the futsal folks to, con to let the company that installs the court know, again, if you approve this, what, what site they could use. So, Nick, what, what is this? What is fut futsal? I saw it. I, had, I mean, it, I probably could have, should have Googled it, and I it, didn't, but. It's a, it's a, it, I don't play, so if there's a futsal player here, you can correct me. Uh, Jim Gibson was going to be here, but he's in transit. Uh, it, it's a type of soccer. It's played with do you, Chris. Do you? It's it's short field soccer. Short sided soccer. Short sided soccer. So they can't don't use the remember? soccer fields or the lacrosse fields. It's a court. It's a court with sides. Yeah. Think of a hockey rink, but oh, uh, or, um, and they use a, a somewhat different, heavier ball. And I think it's geared a lot towards the younger kids, and it, it a lot of. Uh, ball handling skills Balance and things skills. like that. It was appropriate, last time I was here, you were giving out jackets for the Gaudet Junior High School soccer champions. So uh, it was yeah. kind of a, an appropriate uh, lead into that this. Can showed us the design? <laughs> oh yeah, that's oh, right. yeah, you remember that? Okay. Yeah. So, so, so here's, here's the issue with these two sites that I see, and I'm one person, but I, I, the one in, the one in um, Oliphant School, we're looking at making Oliphant School um, affordable housing, and there could be some structures in the back there, depending mm -hmm. upon. There's actually a public hearing, public meeting with the neighbors tomorrow night. Uh, the second site at Potsy Field, we're looking at uh, developing that. Uh, there's there's a there's a proposal um, that has to be vetted out, um, but so I don't. I don't know if there's any other sites, Nick, you looked at, because I don't those, believe those, those two are going to work. Uh, we, there were other sites that were eliminated because they, they didn't meet the requirements. They were passive use only. The, 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 um, the idea that, they, that was sort of proposed back in January, and again, Jim, the, the futsal folks aren't here, uh, it is portable. You know, it's movable. Yeah, I think so, you said it took a week or two to disassemble right, the, the it. Idea, it's not like a tent. You just pick it up and move it every week. Uh, the idea was maybe um, Potsy would work until, you know, in a year when they just started to develop the Potsy area, then we would go to a, our secondary location that for this would be, have been uh, Oliphant Field. And, and, you know, you can put it there, and then they, maybe they would have a year there or something like that. So re, there were no other areas that we, that open space came up with that were, that met easily the needs that we saw that they don't, it, it can go on a, a hard surface that's already paved. Um, there was parking, it's right on the you know, tr transit area, it's easy to get to. Uh, it's areas that are already used for recreation, so you, you don't have the concerns like we did have possibly, you know, in some of the other projects came up about neighbors, uh, you know, being concerned about noise and traffic and things like that. The idea was floated at one point, well, what about Linden? We kind of figured we've pushed Linden Park a little bit more than we want to add anything else to it at this point, you know, if we can get the, uh, the pickleball folks situated in Linden, uh, then maybe that might, and then maintain the, the practice fields that they use there, the lacrosse kids and the soccer kids for their practice. We didn't want to overburden Linden at this point. Um, but these were, the, these were the areas that seemed to make the most sense to us and that the futsal people thought would work for them. So um, it would just be a matter then of deciding if these, if the town was agreeable to this, then we would go back to them and Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you. So the idea, if you remember from the last discussion, was they would like to get this in town and started, and there's no cost to the town, right? Just providing a space. They understand that Potsy Field, so their season they're looking at is the off-season where you're not on grass. November, December, January, February, till you right now, in April, when you're going to get back outside. 
That's, that's their window. They understood that Potsy Field would probably only give them one opportunity this fall, and then it would be over. At that time, they could potentially move to Oliphant. <clears throat> now, you're right, Oliphant, affordable housing, we're talking about it, but so this, th there still has to be an agreement. I mean, they, they have to get, you know, they get outside funding that buys it, they install it, all that kind of stuff. They, there would have to be some agreement between the town and Futsal that here's the deal. You can go to Potsy for, you know, six months. You then have the opportunity to go to Oliphant potentially for a year or until we give you, you know, three months and you got to leave or six months or whatever time frame. So it's not a, they're not, it's not a permanent forever site. And they might say, no, I don't want to move it twice. There's nowhere else. You can't give me a third spot. No, we can't. So maybe their funders, you know, won't, won't support it. But at this point, um, my biggest, I think my biggest concern is not Potsy because they're going on the asphalt, but is Linden and T-Ball and to ensure that that wouldn't displace those kids, or that there wouldn't be some way to work around. So when is the season? The off season, as Tom yeah, was yeah. saying. So we were just throwing, hypothetically, if if the town said, oh, that might, that's a good idea, go ahead with it. Where we are right now, if they contacted their people who install this, they would be looking at being up and operational about November, I think is what uh, Jim mm. said. So, which is when they would be, the fall competitive soccer season usually uh, wraps up sometime around th uh, Halloween when it starts getting dark earlier and things like that. So that would be just about good timing. They would get their winter season in there. And, uh, and depending on what's going on at Potsy at the time, uh, they could keep using it. Or if then, you know, six months down the road, you said, okay, in, in three months, you guys are gonna have to pack up and move, then they would have to have that contingency plan in place to, yeah. uh, to move. Yeah, and I think we had a discussion earlier tonight in executive session about a, another issue uh, over in that area. Um, we're not sure of the time frame when it's going to happen. Um, we're going to get some information in a couple of weeks about it, um, for our, maybe before that, but before for our next meeting in two weeks. So I, I don't know. Whatever you guys want to do, it's the, either place they're going to end up moving. So, Mrs. Santos. Go ahead, Mr. Walsh, your vice Mrs. Santos. Okay. Not being familiar with this type of game, I'm going to throw two locations out to you. How about the Wyatt Road field? There is already a complex there and facilities. Can you use that? I can. I, I don't. I guess that would depend on the Middletown youth soccer folks on one hand. But the issue with that, the problem there is how wet it is. And okay. They try to keep everybody off in the winter. All right. Yep. Uh, my next. It's the only time the grass gets the rest. My next location would be the back property of the Godday School, which fronts the Wyatt Road, which has an entrance and there's an empty field there. Is there not? Am I wrong? Is that on the school, pro on the playground? I'm not, I'm just, uh, it's whatever. It's way in the back. That would still be on the school property. And I yes. don't know, when we were looking at possible pickleball sites, one of the things that came up was that you wouldn't be able to, act, you shouldn't be on it during school hours, but. This is vacant property, this is empty. Where, where are you talking sure. about? Okay, you got Wyatt Road, right? And you got property right along here in back of the ball field, don't you? Or am I wrong? Well, you, are you talking about between state the garage. fence and the state garage, the fence right. and the track? Right. That's still school property. I don't. All right. Well, we own it, don't we? Town owns it. I don't. I don't know. I don't. I'm, that's, my I'm just saying that for pickleball, we were looking at an area in there and. It came well, we were looking closer to the cafeteria. Right, where that little uh, yeah. baseball diamond is. Yeah. But, uh, All right, it was just a suggestion. Um, so, well, uh, guys, what's the, uh, what, what do you want to do here? <coughs> Mr. President? I'd like to put them in the, the potsy and get them going. Yeah. This is great activity for our kids. Mm -hmm. It's a good program. Good location. I'm just concerned uh, that they set up for, for a month or two they and know they have to get out. Go. But they, one of the things that they talked about... Out with them and if, if they are willing to set it up and move it, I, I think 
right. they will tell us right off the bat if they do not want to move it in, in the short time frame. I think we should offer it. If they're willing to do the work and they're funding it, I don't see the downside. Unless somebody sees the downside and wants to share. So I, I just say this because my son participates. There's a flag football league at Potsy, which takes place through October 31st. They're constructing this thing in the parking lot, which is tight already, for the kids that are there for flag football. We can talk. I can get the uh, the proper people in here, but it, it's not a well, well, your your kids play. play. I mean, it's not a big no. It's it's not structure, huge. and so I don't know how much uh, disruption there would be in in constructing it. But I would need the futsal that, people to be able to explain that. Oh, pardon me. Is that this picture? It looks like it's on concrete. It Are is. It's on the flag flag football football in the parking lot. That's on asphalt. It's in the parking lot, which is I'm sorry? on Saturday evenings consumed for flag football. Oh, they play on the concrete? We, no, no, we play on Potsy Field, but they you got to get your kid there. You have to park in there. The parking lot's full during Yeah, flag. I don't have a hang glider to get there. i got to drive and park someplace. <laughs> I, I, I thought you flew. <laughs> I do fly. Only when I have a cake. Okay, let's reel, <laughs> let's reel this in. So what, what's the... Uh, and maybe Oliphant. We what's, just what's the consensus? Offer Oliphant then? I, I would probably offer Oliphant for the time being because we don't know how long that application process is going to take. Right. They could probably be there a little bit longer. I know it's not uh, an asphalt or a concrete surface, but I think it gives them more of a chance, or probably a longer chance to, okay. to be in one location rather than having to move. So I'll, I'll let them know that they, whatever they need to do now as far as making contact with the town to get clearance for what has to happen in order to have this installed. And it's off season from T-ball, so that wouldn't be an issue, correct? And, and you, that it field that, the, issue. that we picked to, to put the footprint is a field that looks fairly overgrown. That particular little diamond looks fairly overgrown in the image there compared to the other T-ball diamond at right. Elephant, so. Okay, you guys okay with that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Peter, you would have to make sure that yeah, we're going to make sure that there's a an, an agreement and insurance and exactly. all the usual. Uh, so, uh, the Jim Gibson, who's our my contact person, I'll let him know to that he and whoever the I mean the, I have the name of the company that does this would need to make talk to the town and figure out how to go okay. about the, the nuts That's and bolts right of getting right. things going. Very good, Nick. Thanks very much. Thank you so it. much. Thanks for sticking it out tonight. Okay. Good luck. Okay. Um, 29. Number 29, at the request of myself, uh, reference to an email communication from Dave Travers, request support for the Gorday uh, boys baseball and girls softball teams. Motion received said email communication authorized $800 for the Gorday boys baseball team and authorized $800 for the girls softball team allocated to the present from the allocated to be allocated from the council president's discretionary fund. Second. Is there any discussion on this? I'll, I'll tell you, I got a call from, he's a new coach. Mm -hmm. He called me, he wants, uh, they have a lot of outdated equipment and uniforms. These specifically are warm-up jackets. Um, and he also informed me that in speaking to the athletic director, that rule titles Title nine, nine. Title nine states that if you do something for the for a, a boys' sport, you have to do it for, for the girls', the girls, the girls sport. sport. Absolutely. So the girls' softball team could also use equipment. Um, <laughs> so why not? Why not? <laughs> mm -hmm. I just, I just wonder. Uh, I I don't have any problem with sports. Typically, I'm just wondering though, eighth grade and warm-up jackets. I yeah. If it were, everybody get the same sweatshirt at Walmart. They're passing down uniforms, their hats, and everything else is what he told me at this point in time. So he wants to change it up a little bit as a new coach and try and change that culture a little bit. So, unless you want to okay. write him a check, Mr. Welch. I never like baseball. All right, all right. <laughs> you don't like baseball? Okay. All right, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Excellent. Thank you, guys. Town Council number 30, Memorandum of Council Von Villas, in reference to impact and recovery of COVID-19 pandemic on library services. Motion to receive said memorandum. Motion received said memorandum. Second. The motion is second to receive. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mrs. Von Villas. 
Yes, I, I asked to have this put on the, uh, on the docket because I thought it would be really nice if the library got some, some publicity within the town about the good things that they've been doing. Um, they've had a pretty tough time since um, with the onset of COVID and uh, the director is here tonight. Um, and I, what, what, what happened, this came from this report that's attached to my email is the report that she gave at the, um, at the board meeting um, in March. And I, and I looked at it and I thought, well, gee, that's the kind of thing that maybe the town itself should be aware of as, as to how um, it has a resource that is um, so successful. So um, basically that's what this is for, is just to, to ensure that, um, that the town becomes aware a, a little more so um, of the of the good good resource that's there um, um, and maybe appreciate it. Um, the director is here tonight. <laughs> she um, sat through the entire meeting. And if you have any questions that you wanted to ask about, because it is a lengthy report, um, if you wanted to ask her anything, I'm sure she'd be glad to um, to answer any questions. But but I'm pretty proud of of uh, what has been accomplished, and I just wanted to share it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you for bringing this up. Teresa's here. Teresa, is there anything you'd like to say? You guys do just do a fantastic job over that library. I mean, you know, we need a, we need a director in every position like Teresa Koish because, and I mean that sincerely. Thank you. From a budget to an operations to, the, to the, all the things you guys do, it's, I, people just don't realize it. So I appreciate you, Mrs. Von Villas, bringing this up and, you know, um, you guys are just, I, I know you can't produce budget presentations like Steve Arndt did, but <laughs> you guys operate uh, extremely well uh, as when Steve was there, and he's probably even better at this point. And I can say that because he's in Ohio or Chicago, wherever he's at. Mm -hmm. But um, I just want to thank you for what you do over there and all, your, all, the, uh, all the good things you do in, in, on a daily basis. Well, thank you. So, Teresa Kosh, Library Director, 700 West Main Road, Middletown, Rhode Island. And by the way, Steve Arndt is in Kansas now, and we still email. You do? Yeah, yeah. He has reviewed the um, Middletown Commons, and, and he's sent me a number of things about it. So he's oh, still, excellent. Yeah, still excellent. very involved. He's but, a good um, guy. I, thank you for, um, for supporting the library, for recognizing what we do. Um, it's, it's a two-way street. We, I, I, I say this uh, unabashedly that Middletown is a good employer, and I tell that to, to anybody. The, um, yeah, the library service is really um, a lot like what you do. Um, we figure it out, we keep going forward, and we adapt. We listen to what our patrons tell us and make it work. Well, it's easy. You make it easy for us when we're making decisions up here. The library, you're always reasonable. Uh, the requests are, are, are very humble um, on, on what's really needed and, but compared to what the services you guys provide. Talk about make and do, you're, you're, you, you've set the bar for that. So we certainly appreciate that. Well, thank you very much. Anybody have any questions about anything? Okay, all right, thank you, good night. So thank you for sticking out tonight. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Excellent, okay. So let's move on to uh, number 31, uh, Vice President, member and Vice President Welch. That's withdrawn. Still have to read it in. You do? I do. You, no problem. Oh. Member and Vice President Welch in reference to proposed 2022 ballot question term limits, amends Article 2, the Town Council Section 202, qualification of members, vacancy occurs if member becomes disqualified. Motion to withdraw this item. Second. We have a motion to second to withdraw. Any discussion? Have All in question. favor? Aye. Uh, hang on. Nope. Yes. Can I ask why it's being withdrawn? Or? Just did. I'm sorry? What's the question? Who wants to know why it's being withdrawn. Changed my mind. Okay. Is it satisfactory? We'll talk later. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We have a motion to second withdraw. All in favor? Aye. 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 Number 32, Memorandum of Council of Flynn in reference to update requests, opera, um, opera projects. Motion to, Motion to receive said memorandum. Second. 
We have a motion to second to receive said memorandum. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mrs. Flynn. <clears throat> well, we, there's some supplemental information on the dais that um, updates or, or addresses a lot of the issues on my memo of the docket. So the, uh, apparently the planning board is going to be reviewing the list of ARPA projects on uh, May 11th at its regular meeting. Yep. So that answers where the projects list sits right now. And there's attached to that, uh, if I, I, again, just glanced at it, you might have to help me out, Sean. This is the, this is the, um, like where the monies are or are going or are proposed to go. Do you want to explain that spreadsheet? Just because I, I honestly just got it tonight, so I, I haven't had much of a chance to take a look. So it's, it's exactly as you described it. It's a summary of the money that we've received and it details out the money that's been appropriated by the town council so far. Uh, and it also uh, identifies where, uh, as we're potentially budgeting for the upcoming year, uh, what programs we would be looking at uh, using the dollars for. So, uh, but those are not written in stone yet, so. Um, those are things that are being finalized over the upcoming weeks as we finalize the budget. And that will be posted on the Middletown Shares area for folks to take a look at? What will be funded, posted? The, this um, spreadsheet? Um, I think the spreadsheet's more of a working document. Okay, um, so when it becomes more, you know, people are wondering because they haven't heard anything really since January or February when mm -hmm. we forwarded the projects. Yep. So if there's something that you could get on there, uh, I think that that would answer a lot of questions. Also the timeline that is on the Middletown Shares uh, web page is still the September timeline and we do have a January 3rd updated timeline. Uh, if that could be updated, that would be great also. So as a quick question, just because it was asked to me, the monies, are they earning interest anywhere or are they? Uh, yes, it's at the top of the schedule. Mark okay. has indicated the interest that it's earning. Oh, okay, I see so it it's, now. It's in its own account. Yep, okay, great. And uh, the, the projects are going to the planning board for the planning board's review as their um, compliance to the comprehensive plan, correct? Yes. So then they're coming to the council and we will then put them in order of priority, what we think is most important. Is that the process? You know, we have our council priorities. I, I just was not exactly sure when it comes back to us what that task will be. So we'll provide recommendations. The council will review it and make amendments and then you'll adopt a final budget for the dollars. Okay, very good. Did I leave anything out? I don't think so. <laughs> Thank okay, you. Mrs. Santos. Thank, Thank, you, Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Mr. Brown, the interest that we earned, what amount did that interest earn on? What amount was that interest earned? Am I saying it right? So the first tranche of money is uh, $2.4 million. Uh, is, that, is that your question? That's, that's the principal Right, amount. and what kind of interest are we earning? What percentage? Do I see it? Yeah, Mark, <laughs> Mark's, <laughs> gonna, Mark's gonna help us it answer that question. It would be something like 0 .05. It, it's How very close? small. It has to be invested in something that is secure. Yeah. So we will, it's a lower interest rate when you invest in that. So it is a low rate, yes. Is it CDs or? No, that, um, it's just regular in our investment account in that special revenue fund for the ARPA money. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Mark. So that's the best we can get. Uh, that is where we typically invest money. It's, if you do CDs, that could be long term. We really do not know when we're spending the money, so I didn't want to commit to saying two year or whatever. We just don't know when we're spending the money. 
So that's that, to answer a question that is like point zero zero. It's, it's like point zero one percent. Yeah. Point zero zero five percent. Oh, I made out better. That's all we can get. Yes. A one or two percent or anything <laughs> like that. There's nothing out there, nope, and we're yeah. we're restricted by law on what we can invest in. Yes, ma'am. Mark. Yes. I got CDs mm -hmm. for not myself personally, but six months. The town cannot go for six months on interest. Get in a CD earning interest for six months. It depends when we spend the money. There is no plan. And if I commit to six months, then there's a penalty to take it out sooner. Right. I can look into the options, but I okay. want to have direction before I start investing when I really don't know the plan yet. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mr. President? Yes, ma'am. Uh, could I ask uh, Mr. Brown to add the <coughs> ARPA projects on the project list so that if there's anything that when you're um, sharing with the council the update on projects, if there's anything to add on the AP ARPI projects, you can mention it? I could put that on my informal list, yes. Thank you. The two-minute informal list. That's right. The two-minute informal list. list. Be clear about that. Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, Terry, you're all set? Yes, ma'am, sir. Okay. Sure. okay. <laughs> Uh, let's move on to the town administrator number 33, Memorandum of Town Planner in reference to 2022 RIDEM Open Space Acquisition Grant Award. Motion to continue. Second. We have a motion to second to continue this. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Number 34, resolution of the council in reference to authorizing town administrators to accept the grant and execute all necessary agreements and provide required documentation to RIDEM. Um, and authorize the town council president to execute the required conservation easement and allocate town matching funds in the amount of $200,000 from an open space bond. Motion to continue. Second. I have a motion to second to continue. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Number 35, communication of tax assessment in reference to cancellation of taxes for certain Middletown residents. Motion to receive said communication. Second. I have a motion to second to receive uh, we'll roll right into the uh, resolution. All in favor? Aye. 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 Number 36, resolution of the council in reference to cancellation of taxes for certain Middletown residents. Motion to pass said resolution. Any dis... Yes. Second or no? Second. Okay, discussion. Yes. Mrs. Santos. Mr. Brown, I sat with Mr. Durgan and I got all my answers today. He was excellent, so I'm very happy and... Thank you. I'm glad he was helpful. He's under strict <laughs> orders to be helpful to you. He's under strict <laughs> orders. That's it. Oh, shush. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And this is what we've been looking for. Can you say that again, please? Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.